RS25 engine reached 111% power. Nice. Nice, nice. Actually, you know what? We should play Summer Car. I'll play Summer Car, and then if I'm feeling it, we'll play Hearts of Iron on the back half of the, uh, on the back half of the stream. So, still got plenty of stream left. I'll be back momentarily. And we'll go from there. Formations like these require long hours of intensive drilling and careful judgment. When the troop goes around the corner, the riders on the outside of the turn have to adjust their speed to keep even with the riders on the inside. The man on the outside has to ride a lot farther and a lot faster in order to keep up with the parade. The outside wheels must spin faster than the wheels on the inside because they have a greater distance to travel in the same length of time. When a wagon turns a corner, the wheels can travel at different speeds because each one can turn freely on the axles. And in the early automobiles, the rear wheels turn separately and only one wheel was connected to the engine. But when only one wheel was driven by the engine, it had to do all the work and it couldn't get a good enough grip on the road to do its job properly. So the one wheel drive was soon out of date. But if two wheels are locked on an axle so that they are not free to turn separately, one or the other has to slide. So engineers had to find a way to connect both rear wheels to the engine without sliding and slipping on turns. The device which makes this possible is a part of the rear axle. It is called the differential, because it can drive the rear wheels at different speeds. The differential looks complicated, but once we understand its principle, it is amazingly simple. These two wheels are mounted on separate axles and supported by a frame, so that they can revolve freely at different speeds. Let's fasten a spoke on the inner end of each axle so that by turning the spokes, we can turn each wheel separately. With a bar or cross piece, we can turn both wheels in the same direction at the same rate of speed. 
Let's get something to hold this bar in place so that it will press against the spokes. Notice that this support is not locked to the axle. It turns freely. Now we can spin the wheels by rotating the support. This is fine as long as both wheels are able to turn at the same speed. But let's see what happens when we go around the corner. With this arrangement, we cannot drive one wheel faster than the other. And if we stop one wheel, the other wheel won't budge. Let's put this bar on a pivot so that it can swing in either direction. Now, the bar can still turn both wheels at the same speed. And because it pivots, it lets one wheel turn even when the other is stopped. But if turned too far, the bar will swing around until it won't drive the spokes that turn either wheel. We need another crossbar and more spokes to carry on the job. When we stop one wheel, the crossbars will continue to push the spokes of the free wheel around. As long as both wheels are free to turn, the bars do not swing on their pivot and the wheels move at the same speed. Now we have the working principles of a differential. To adapt the model for use in an automobile, we will have to make a few changes. In order to reduce the jerky action caused by wide spaces between the spokes, we will put in more spokes. Further filling in the spaces between the spokes gives steadier, more continuous action. And changing the shape gives firm, constant contact. Now we can make the gears thicker and stronger. And we have differential gears. The edges are cut so that they will fit together more smoothly and silently. And another gear is added to share the work of driving the axles. The principle is the same. In order to turn the support and drive the wheels, we can fasten a large gear here, connected by a smaller gear to a source of power. Notice that the power is connected to the differential at the center line. We can make our model more compact by moving the gears closer together. When we put our differential in an automobile, we have to leave room for the drive shaft, which carries the power from the engine. We may build the floor of the car above the drive shaft. But if we do, we won't have much room inside unless we make the top of the car high too. Of course, we could lower the floor and ceiling but the drive shaft would be higher than the floor. This would have disadvantages. A shaft in the middle of the floor of an automobile would be inconvenient for passengers and would be awkward for carrying luggage. Today, engineers have found a way to make the car roomier and closer to the road without a clumsy shaft above the floor. The drive shaft from the engine to the differential is lowered out of the way and the drive shaft is connected to the rear axle at the bottom. The new low center drive makes the rear axle quieter, stronger, and more durable because it gives better, smoother contact between the gears. The automobile of today with the low center drive is stronger and more rugged. Every part of the rear axle has been built to withstand strains far greater than it will ever meet on the straightaway or around the corner.
Mr. Archimedes of ancient Greece. Long ago, Archie said, Give me a lever long enough and I can move the world. What Archimedes meant was that the power of a lever is practically unlimited. Today, almost everyone uses some form of lever in his daily work. The familiar can opener is a lever with a sharp cutting edge. The playground seesaw is just a simple lever too. It takes a lot of force to start a freight car moving, yet the railroad man can start the heaviest freight cars easily with a pinch bar, a powerful lever which turns the wheel. Tough luck, old boy. Here's a place where a lever comes in mighty handy. Let's take the simplest kind of lever, a rigid bar working on a fixed support called a fulcrum. One end of this lever is twice as long as the other. Let's put a 10 pound weight on this end and now we'll put half as much weight on this end. Five pounds, balance 10. If we have 25 pounds to lift, we just use a longer lever. The five pounds will now balance five times as much. Let's raise the lever in the air, change its shape a little, and we have a crank. Or we can add a second lever and have a double crank. Now the short arm moves one fourth the distance, but we get four times the force. If we want continuous motion, we need more arms. Now we have levers that turn. The larger paddle wheel makes fewer turns, but it delivers more force. A paddle wheel is nothing but a never ending series of levers. We can make the wheels stronger and lessen friction where the wheels touch each other by rounding off the edges and shaping them into teeth that will slide in and out smoothly. Now, the power flows smoothly and continuously through spinning leverage of gear wheels. Gears are made in many kinds and many sizes. Little gears, big gears, worm gears, bevel gears, and even lopsided gears. Over a hundred million gears are spinning over the roads in the transmissions of our automobiles. The transmission is located right at the bottom of the gear shift lever. Let's start from scratch and put together a model of the gears that we shift in our motor car. The shaft on the left comes from the engine. The shaft on the right carries the power back to the rear wheels. To connect these two with gears, we'll need another shaft, known as a counter shaft. These two gears carry the power from the engine shaft to the counter shaft and are always connected or in mesh. This gear on the drive shaft going to the wheels is free to turn around the shaft. We'll put it in mesh with another gear on the counter shaft. These gears are always in mesh and keep turning while the engine is running. To switch from one set of gears to another, our transmission needs a short shaft like this, known as a clutch sleeve. It cannot turn on the drive shaft, but it is free to slide back and forth. On the sleeve, we'll mount a large gear, which we can shift back and forth to mesh with the small gear in the middle of the counter shaft. We are now in neutral. The gears that are always in mesh are turning over with the engine, but the shaft to the rear wheels is standing still. A 3,000 pound automobile takes a lot of force to start. So in low speed, we get the greatest leverage by letting the smallest gear on the counter shaft turn the largest gear on the drive shaft. The engine on this model is running at a constant speed of 90 revolutions a minute. With low gears in mesh, the rear wheel is turning at 30 revolutions a minute, about a third the speed of the engine, but with three times the force. The power is going through these gears in the transmission.
after we've started the car rolling, we want fast pickup. So we shift into second by sliding the sleeve backward to mesh with this gear on the shaft to the rear wheels. The wheel is now turning at 60 revolutions a minute and the power flows through these gears. For higher speeds, we let the power go directly to the rear wheels. We shift the sleeve forward so that it meshes with the shaft from the engine. The power travels straight from the engine to the drive shaft. Now the shaft to the wheels is turning at 90 revolutions a minute, the same speed as the engine. But here's a problem. An automobile must be able to go backward as well as forward. So we add one more set of gears to reverse the shaft to the rear wheels. With the gears shifted into reverse, the power travels through the transmission in a path like this. We now have three sets of spinning levers for going forward and one for reverse. With a gear shift lever, we can shift to any set of gears we wish. But with all these spinning levers in the transmission came noise and wear. Experts could shift gears quietly by careful timing of the gear shift and the engine speeds, but most of us made plenty of noise until new engineering developments made possible the long series of improvements that followed. When we shifted gears, we got a clash because the gears were not running at the same speed. In other words, not synchronized. So engineers set to work to develop a synchronizer. The synchronizer works like a cork twisted into the top of a bottle. The cork will turn until it is so tight that the bottle turns with it. Synchro mesh works the same way. When we shift into second or high, the synchronizer brings the gears to the same speed before they come together. The drums won't let the gears shift unless they are turning at the same speed. When the gears come together, there is no clash and the shift is made quietly and easily. In the transmission of the up-to-date automobile, we have a powerful low gear to give us a strong spinning leverage in starting. A fast turning motor must set the weight of the car in motion. In second speed, we can change leverage to get going fast at the same engine speed. With the leverage of third gear, power goes directly to the rear wheels and we can go as fast as we want. Now every driver can shift gears at any time, regardless of speed. Here is a hill that will give us a real chance to see how smoothly and reliably our spinning levers work in our automobile transmission. This driver is going to let her car gain a speed of 60 miles an hour down the hill. Then she will shift into second speed and bring her car easily and safely under control before it reaches the bottom of the hill. Hello. All right, we're back. I am speed. All right, welcome to Space News, everybody. More wheels. We need more wheels. <laughs> you, got, you have to be able to add more spokes. We need more spokes, so we'll add more spokes. <laughs> okay. All right, what do we got? What do we got? What's after space news? From Salt Taker, what would you want after space news? I was thinking of playing Summer Car. What about you? 
I'm fast as frick, boy. That lady probably nice, nice. MSC, baby. There you go. We'll do MSC, and then I'll play Hearts of Iron after if I'm not tired. <laughs> Okie dokie. All right. Let's do this. Personally, I prefer hearts. Okay. I'll, so, Crasher, I'll probably play hearts again tomorrow. Chess. Ugh. Nah. Nah, I'm good. All right. Let me look around. Let's see what we got. My Summer of Iron. I saw a headline that we touched the sun. We didn't touch the sun, Dex, no. Uh, you're talking about a probe called Parker Solar Probe? Parker Solar Probe didn't fly into the sun. It would There would be nothing left. It's about 8 million miles away at its closest point. Um, it flew through what's called the solar corona. Okay, so what's the solar corona? It, it, now, keep in mind, the sun doesn't have an atmosphere. It's It's too hot way too hot. Any any gases in there would they would just well, I mean weird stuff would happen. Let me put it to you like that. I mean, yeah, they would yeah, probably fuse exactly. That's I mean, that's what's going on there. So the reason why I say there's no gases there but is because of the next thing I'm going to say. So the solar corona is about as close as you're going to get to the sun's atmosphere, okay? atmosphere very very loose quotations there so think about on earth right on earth you'd hit the atmosphere right and you'd you'd, you'd skirt the atmosphere for a second you can bounce off or you re-enter or whatever now parker solar probe is going way too fast to even get to to re-enter near the sun but the cool thing is is that because the sun is so ridiculously hot that plasma naturally occurs near the sun that's why it's so bright that's what you see it's a glowing ball of plasma right uh, so Parker Solar Probe, Probe flew through the solar corona. The, now, once again, it's not it's not flying through like the actual sun, but it's flying through what what you could call the sun's atmosphere. It's like arrow breaking the sun. That's that's basically what it did. It flew through the solar corona, which is where the sun's gravity keeps a lot of ionic radiation and and plasma just kind of stuck in the sun's gravitational pull. Uh, just they just kind of stay there. Like I said, it's a it would be like skirting the atmosphere of Mars or, or, you know, skirting the atmosphere of Earth. That's what it did. But the thing is, you need to be going at ridiculous speeds to get near that thing, uh, because the whole solar system is the whole solar system is kind of turning and everything, and Earth is going sixty six thousand miles an hour, right, orbiting, to get near it. Parker Solar had to grab assist off of Venus, and Venus shot it towards the Sun, and even then, it's still it still is 8 million miles away. Parker Solar Probe at, at perihelion is probably going like 500,000 miles an hour or something ridiculous. Yeah, 500,000 miles an hour. Uh, that's uh, that's a, a pretty crappy estimate. I bet you it's faster than that. Uh, so, did it get slower? I'm not 100% sure they have those findings yet, Da Vinci, but it did fly through a perturbing force, so I can only guess that it lowered aphelion because it braked at perihelion, so yeah. I would guess that it flying through the plasma probably slowed it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Let's watch this. NASCAR did a mock restart with the next gen. Yeah, all the specs are down there, guys. I don't think I can watch this footage, man, without getting... Without getting struck, but that does look pretty nice. The noise sounds very different. Oh no, they just needed to get up to revs. Oh man, those cars look so different. They look so weird. 
So yeah, flying through the solar corona, the solar corona is actually a big deal. That's the first time they've ever, no one's ever done that before. So uh, we're going to learn all kinds of good stuff from the sun. That just looks strange. That just looks very, very strange. That's, what are you looking at? Dare I say it, they look like cars. Hmm. Let me know when they fly through the solar modelo especial, okay? can actually race side by side. Yeah, that's neat. Dude, look at Oh, that's so NASCAR is turning into V8 supercars, man. That's very weird. Anyway, cool. All right, let's see what else what else do we got? James Webb is such a good telescope. Why not build two? Um, that's a good question. I personally think they should build like seven of them. Uh, James Webb, consider it... A better way to look at James Webb is to consider it as a prototype. It's a prototype satellite. You know, the... And this could lead to better versions of the satellite here. Like, the, the situation in which James Webb came about was because of what we learned from Hubble. What was the... What is the point of F1 or NASCAR? I see it just as a waste of fuel. Yeah, Violent, there's this thing called fun that people do from time to time. Yeah, fun. That, that's the point, fun. You know what I'm saying? You gotta have fun from time to time. That's a good way to do it. Fun? <laughs> it's, it's entertainment. It, it's like, fair enough. Like, I mean, not everything can be about, you know, telling everybody about how good of a person you are by you know, lowering your carbon footprint. You know what I'm saying? Like, you gotta have some fun from time to time. There's nothing wrong with that. Gotta have some entertainment. Why do you think people watch sports, man? Take it from somebody that likes sports. Dude, it's a good way to just chill and, and you know, sit back, relax, and just watch something that you like. Mm -hmm. Like like a Twitch stream. <laughs> you know? I mean, you, you violent, as far as I'm concerned, you could make the same argument for me. Like, who wants to sit here and watch someone play video games all day? Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that now, isn't it? The real circle we drive around over and over again are the friends we made along the way, indeed. Yeah. Yeah, well, see, that's a little bit more noble cause than NASCAR, but yeah, right? Yeah, Violent, I mean, does that help? Like, I, I know you didn't mean anything by that, right? Or in case you did, like, I, it's just to have, like, it's entertainment, man. Dude, without stuff, dude, stuff like that is what keeps people sane. I'm, Lewis was robbed. Oh, hi, Blood Fam. How are you? <laughs> no, Mikey, no, no, that is so not right. <laughs> <laughs> no, just a random question. Yeah, I got you, man. Yeah, I didn't I didn't think you meant anything by it. Yeah. No, it's it's entertaining. Like violent I like cars. I like racing cars. Racing cars is very fun. It's very it, it's nerve wracking at times, but it's fun and it's really fun to watch. Uh it's something that you can look forward to at the end of your work week, you know? 
and it you know a lot of people agree with, a lot of people agree with that just got back from wisconsin seriously almost died watching the race <laughs> hated everything hated everything and everyone that day dude i don't blame you blood fam you, i mean you guys got boned pretty badly but a blood like i can't help but think this is pretty selective outrage this has been happening to every other team except mercedes pretty much all year you guys had didn't have any problem with it when it happened to red bull you know <laughs> Yeah, this, yeah. Violent, Violent didn't mean anything by it, dude. He's just asking. Yeah, Violent, it's, it's entertainment, dude. It's fun. I'm telling you, cars is, cars is, cars are fun. They're fun to work on. It, it's, I enjoy messing with it. Like, okay, Violent, you ever, you ever played, I think it's a bit pointless to have a race of 24 hours. Well, it's an endurance race, dude. It, 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 think of it like running a marathon for cars. Same thing. Discovery, go at throttle up. It's fun, man. It, cars are a good time, and I know that cars cars do get gatekeeped because of some of the culture that comes with it. But uh, but cars are they're a good time and they're fun, man. They're really fun. Like think of it like so. How I look at cars, dude, is like Legos. They're like Legos, but you can drive the Lego. Like how cool. Remember remember like everybody had like a building toy, like where you had Meccano, Connects, Legos, whatever. You built like cars and you built trucks or you built you built something like a house or whatever like cars are that but you can actually use it it's just big boy legos that's it or big girl legos doesn't matter uh red bull doesn't even make cars don't at me <laughs> hey rug 51 month resub I'm 35 and no driver's license you don't need one. Oh man driving a car is fun dude you're missing out. Like I'm not saying, oh, you have to buy a car. No, you, I mean that explain that explains why you don't you don't get it. Like me, I grew up with cars, man. My family is a bunch of car car people. Like we 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 like messing with cars. It's fun, dude. It, like I said, it's like it's it. I call it candy for your mind. You know, is candy bad for you? Yeah, sure. No, that's no secret. No, everyone knows that. But that still doesn't stop you from doing it every once in a while, from having some candy, right? You know, it's not like they're racing 24-7 here, you know? they It's something you do on the weekends. I mean, some people make it their job, but then again, I sit here and play video games all day, you know what I mean? Same kind of idea. Trust me, man. Cars are really... its They're a really good time. You can mess with them, and they... Dude, it's candy for your mind. Just like video games would be. It's just, you know. And if someone made a business out of that, well, that's good Good for them, man. Right? Like, it's, yeah, it's, it's really fun. I have driven before. It's fun. Sure, there are trams here in my city and every street, so I don't need a car. Yeah, no, that's cool. Yeah, I understand if you live in the city, dude. That's all good. Yeah, there's no space. Trust me, I know. I have no space to put any of my cars where I live either. I have to put them in storage lots and stuff, which is fun. Or at my parents' house. <laughs> you know, I have that benefit, right? Like, But yeah, I guess if you didn't grow up on it, like if you didn't grow up with it, it's... Looking at it from the outside in, it's, it's like, what? Like, I, I can see that. And I'm telling you, man, it's a good time. Really fun. Yeah, Roadrunner's like, I know a little bit about cars. Permission to post a link. Sure, what's on your mind, dude? Oh, drummer, you got it. Driving is my way of meditating. Dude, I love it. Leroy, I love it. I drove, I mean, I drove the truck across the country, dude. I love it. Ugh, driving is, yeah, meditation. Clear your mind, dude. It's really nice. Occasionally I'll see people romanticize living out of their cars. Mar Marlou, the people that live out of their cars, you know what? You know what the thing is like. Do people want to be seen living out of their cars, or do they actually want to live out of their car? You know what I'm saying? Like, there's people that overland and stuff, which is basically like when you go out camping, you drive your car into the woods and you go camping and go off roading and stuff. That's cool. That's fun. But then I I also know that there's a there's people out there that want to be seen. You know, having a small car. Oh, look at look at how good of a person I am because I'm using minimal resources. Like, there's people like that. Like, uh, yeah, I guess that's cool, but yeah. 
RVs are cool. I just drove 18 hours from Wisconsin and have to do it again next week for Christmas. Driving sucks when it's a chore. Yeah, I can see that. I also remember the social pressure. Yeah, it's like those. Now this video I like a lot. It makes you feel like a kid again. Let me see. Dude, see? Yeah, no. I, I'm telling you. This, cars are just this, but bigger. This is fantastic. Yeah, see? No, if you can understand this, you can understand why people like... Oh, that's a Lego SPMT over there, and I kind of want it. Why did you show me this? Why did you show me this? God damn it. Why, 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 why would you do this? See, dude, okay, Violent, you've seen me look at Starship, right? You see me look at the Starship production site and all the trucks that you need to make that stuff work and all the cranes and stuff that they need. Sa same energy as this, same exact thing, but bigger. It's the same thing, like, it, it, that, dude, I love it. I, dude, this is great. I, dude, I see. I could get into this or get into the big, the actual version of this. I'd like. I'm happy either way. You know. Why did you show me this, man? Now I want these. But racing is the same, same kind of thing. You know, like the excitement that you get from this. It, it's the same, same thing, but with racing cars, man. I do appreciate this, though. Yeah, you got to move those one by one bricks around. It has RVs for the cab for it does, dude. Dude, look at this. This is dope, man. This is violent. The, the, the same reason that you like this is the same reason why people like racing, dude. It's the same thing. It's just, dude, some people like, see, I like utility trucks. Like, dude, I'm into this. This is fine. But I'm also into racing, too. I like racing cars. I like driving. I like the competition. That's good for you, you know? Yeah, it looks like, dude, these things probably have a pneumatic system in it. You know, let's let's look. Lego Technic and scale models at Lego Exhibition Bricking Bavaria. Okay, so it's German. So it probably it probably really does have pneumatics in it. But bro, look at the SPMT. Oh, that's a Technic SPMT, and I want it. Oh, that's bullcrap, dude. A Lieber. Oh, the Lieber crane right there. That's really freaking cool, and I want one. See, this is cool, man. This, I dig it. Like, I get I get the same kind of hype from when I see the trucks driving around in Boca Chica building launch pads. That's my favorite. Oh, that's so legit. <laughs> you see, the, the dump flap is just counterweighted. That's it. It's just on a weight. So when the, when the bed goes up, the thing just opens. Simple mechanics right there. Oh, these things are so legit, dude. I don't know if the music's good, but these are cool, man. You'll see the crane later, but Violent, does that make sense? It's the same thing, dude. Like, I'd probably be happy it's watching a construction start, site, right? just as happy watching a construction site I'm watching a race. Like, I like all mechanical things, man. I don't discriminate. I'm greedy. <laughs> I'm greedy. I want all the things. Ooh, Doriftu car. Caligula, 71 month resub. Bro, the Lieber crane though. That's amazing. Look at that crawler. Thing's a beast, dude. Yeah, see, no, this 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 does this, yeah, this does it for me too. I, I dig it. Oh, they got a Peterbilt over there. Big boy Peterbilt. Yeah, this is cool, man. I don't like, you don't like cab overs? These are called COEs, dude. Cab over engine. Engineers, they're not good at coming up with names. The cab is over the engine. Yeah, uh, COEs are cool, I guess. They're, they're, they're neat. I'm, I'm in, yeah, see? This is what I like right here. That's the, the, the front nose, yeah. Yeah, baby, Mack truck. Now we're talking. Oh, yeah, no, that's cool. That's cool. I dig this. This gives me the same vibes as when I go to the Toy Train Museum. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Something about watching a construction site, guys. It's very strange. I, there's some weird primal instinct there that I don't understand. Same thing for watching cars go down a highway. Whoa. Whoa. No way. Panda, you seeing this? What's that? It's back. What's that? ExoMars discovers hidden water in Mars's Grand Canyon. Cool. That's Joey Joey's trailer. Oh, you jackknifed it, guy. Oh, it's a side dump. I get it. The Coca-Cola truck, though. Nice. Yeah, this is legit, dude. Yeah, side dump. Oh, yeah, there you go. I love how they use the one-by-one one bricks as dirt. <laughs> nice bulldozer. Cool. All right, let me see. I want to get to the crane. There's the, this is so violent. That's called a low boy trailer. A low boy trailer disjoints the fifth wheel, so you can so you don't have to drive something up over the wheels. Yeah, low boy trailers. Falcon Nine uses something like this. It's not it's not exactly a low boy trailer, but Falcon Nine does use use a highly modified version of that to move uh, to get moved around on the highways. Is that actually carrying cryogenics in it? Bro, Joey. Right, exactly, Red Fox. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. It's the same. Holy crap, I want that. I want this. I don't need that, but... Yeah, see? Yeah, that's cool, man. Is he carrying the load markers? It's German, so you know he's got the right load markers on. Yeah, it does. I can't read it. Is that th that thing's actually carrying cryogenics. What? what? Okay. All right. Dude, the self-propelled transporters, man. Oh, that's cool. Tractor. John Deere. He's pulling that big cat excavator. Look at that thing. I saw one of these being driven around today when I was out and about. Yeah, it could be just dry ice. I mean, that's cryogenic. See, I like I like the big boy versions of these, but this is still cool. I st I'm still into it, Violent. This is neat. But yeah, can you understand? Like, racing is same same kind of thing, dude. You do it because it makes you happy. People people enjoy it. I enjoy it, man. I'm a big big. I love race cars, dude. But I also really like this too. But hopefully that makes sense, you know. Oh, look at this little guy. Oh, you don't. Ah, you're getting some wheel slip, dude. You don't want wheel slip. I got it, Swishio. Yep. Did you watch Clarkson's Farm? Yeah, and it made me want to buy farming equipment. What the hell am I going to do with farming equipment? I don't know. <laughs> the hell am I? It made me want to buy a tractor. I, I don't need. I don't need. I don't need Jeremy's tractor. That Jeremy's tractor is too big, much too big. But I want a tractor. Farm with it, you fool. Oh yeah, you're right. I act, dude, my favorite, my favorite part of the entire thing was the combine harvester. When they get the combine harvester working with the tractor pulling the truck and the, they gotta, they gotta basically do the equivalent of like in-flight refueling to keep loading up the combine harvester because if the combine stops, you're losing money. I was like, oh, that's cool. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. That's really neat. Yeah. Oh man, I really enjoyed that. Sorry to interrupt, but do you know where I could find the YouTube audio video John Young being told while on the moon that the space shuttle was approved? Uh, try Apollo, try YouTubing Vulcan Apollo Seven or Apollo Sixteen EVA shuttle. I know about farming simulator. You can get a Ford two thousand tractor. It's best of both worlds. Yeah. Yes. If I buy a house with and I have a big enough plot of land when we do it, when Primo and I do it, Matt, I will. I'll buy a tractor. Of course. Look, if you got a if you got a decent sized plot of land, having a tractor makes sense. You can move stuff around. I'm not hauling bags of fertilizer everywhere. Screw that. Put them on the tractor. Put them on a pallet. Put them on the tractor. Easy. What else we got? I want to see that crane working, Violent. 
But hopefully that makes sense, dude. It's this, people, you know, like you got to think about it from both. Think about it from both ways. Why the hell would somebody do this? You, I'm sure there's somebody out there that probably thinks this is a waste of time. But you know what? I don't. I think this is cool. Just like there are people out there that think racing is a waste of time. I don't. I think racing is cool. And you know what, man? Something that I'm getting to learn more and more, it's easier just being nice. Like, I, I know, funny concept. Look, I don't hate on this. I think that's neat. That's really cool. I, dude, I could get into this. And if I did, it would be bad because I would want to build the craziest thing. Like, I'd be building that stupid crane over there. Well, I have you here. What would you recommend for your American truck simulator? What do you mean, what would I recommend? A wheel? G29? G29, a good entry-level wheel. Like, there's no... Why hate on this? This is cool. It's just a smaller version of the same thing. Look at I me. Mean, look at the feed hopper. That's neat. He's going to scoop this up. He's going to dump it in the feed hopper. Watch. And the feed hopper has an auger in it, just like a real one would. And it goes up the conveyor belt, and it, it's, a, it's for vertically loading. See? It's going to take that front-end loader. That's not a bulldozer. That's a front-end loader. That's a bulldozer over there. Differences. See, the, the, there's a big difference. The front-end loader has a bucket. The bulldozer doesn't have a bucket. Right? See? He's going to take that. He's going to dump it. The auger, there's an auger in here like a snowblower that's going to take it and it's going to start pushing it up the conveyor belt. The feed hopper. Shut up. Shut your mouth. <gasps> I want it. I want it. I want it. I want it now. That is awesome. Yeah, see? Look. He, the crane is running pulleys just like the real one would. He's using pulleys to, to be able to get the torque to pull this thing up. See? And he's gonna he's gonna take the ore. Or it's just a bunch of Legos. He's gonna open up the bucket. You gotta you gotta hold on for a second, make sure he's centered. Don't drop it too fast or you're gonna miss. Good enough. No, EJ, it's ore. Alright, that's fine. I wanna see that lattice crane over there. See that see the yellow lattice crane in the background? It's cool, man. This is see, I dig it, dude. That's really neat. It, it is Legos, yeah. No, it absolutely. That's a way station. When it, wh where is that goalie? Six minute thirty in the video. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. They did. I saw it, Dead Crew, right? Oh, oh, that's awesome. Oh, that is so legit. I love it. Oh, yep, yeah, see? The counterweight, counterweight's behind me, went under tension when he picked the chair up. The real crane does this. Watch the counterweight move when the chair, when the chair, when, so, first thing when a crane lifts something up, guys, is they tension the wires, okay? You don't just, up oh, lift it up now. No, no. You pull and you tension the wires, okay? Once the wires are under a static tension load, then you start pulling up. And when you start pulling the wires, the, the you start moving the hook up, watch the counterweight. See? See? It balances out. The counterweight moves up for a second, and then it balances out. That's cool, man. Do you want you need one of these to lift a V8? I have an engine crane. But the engine crane isn't a counterweighted lattice crane like this. Yeah, Hosen, I got you. Uh, you don't want to rotate too fast. If you rotate too fast, the chair will get moment over the counterweight and the the, the main mast can deflect. If you get deflection with the crane, bye bye. Cranes aren't designed to have force put on them from the side. It's just straight. Oh! 
That is a big freaking jib. Holy crap. That's a lot of jib, Gully. Why the heck would you need that much? That's a lot of jib. But you see he's got the pendants. This is SpaceX crane does this. So this is a this is a lattice setup that's designed to reach far out. That's why you you cannot pick up something heavy with this much reach. That's no good. You can't so he's got the main mast right here. He's running two jibs. He's got the derrick. Or no, that's not the main mast. That's the main boom, the derrick. He's and he's running a mast over there. You got two twin jibs and then you got an extended an extended boom right here. That's a really long boom. I know King Kitten, right? Isn't that dope? See? Violet, I think that's cool. And I think it's bigger brother is cool. Because you know what's messed up? It's the same physics. Same thing. It's, physics doesn't change. It doesn't matter if it's made out of Lego or not. It's the same thing. That's why it's cool. Oh, the little telescopey crane. That's cute. Hey, Meeps, what's going on? <laughs> I want it. I want it so bad. That thing is so cool. I want it. Dude, goalie, even the hooks are right. That's so legit. Oh, oh, I want that. That's so cool. Those pesky Germans. I know, right? Oh, that's, dude, I would have so much fun with this. I'm 33 years old and I would have fun with this and I don't give a frick who knows. That is so cool. I'd be lifting my groceries up and putting them in the freaking fridge. <laughs> oh, Primo's gonna hate me. <laughs> I'm like, picking up the groceries. Oh, we gotta take out the trash. Let me get the crane out. Yep, yep, take the trash out. There we go. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. You get it out the way you could try, Jam. You see that thing? It's as big as a living room. Whip out the credit card, yeah. I mean, is this a custom set, dudes? That doesn't look like a custom set, but if it is, that's damn impressive. How does the extended arm not fall over? Counterweights, bro. See the big weight back there? It's counterweight. Okay, remember, we're, Crasher, were you here when I showed the lever video? About, about differentials and transmissions with the gears and levers? The, the key to the crane here is not that this is heavy. I mean, that's heavy. But he's running a counterweight right here. But depending on the lift, depending on... So, okay. The crane configuration entirely depends on what you're doing. All right? It's entirely application. Okay? You got to remember, this is a lever crane. All right? Germanic people designed this. Okay? Now, lever, I think, is Swiss. But you get what I'm trying to say. All right? So... If you're trying to pick this truck up, okay, where are you picking it up, where's it going, and how far, okay? Where's it going and how far are kind of the same thing. So, okay, you need to position the crane in a way. Now, keep in mind, you have to have a spot where the crane can hang. Uh, the crane can hang out, it, and it has to be on a nice level surface. If you're not on a level surface, crane can't lift. Don't lift stuff up on a hill. Bad idea. Because then the crane, you go to lift, the crane's just going to fall over, right? So you gotta find a flat spot for your crane. So, okay, say the flat spot's 20 meters away from where you're picking stuff up. Well, now you gotta run the appropriate counterweight. And that's gonna determine the configuration of the crane. How far does the crane need to reach out to grab something? If it needs to reach out a good distance, you're gonna put, the, you're gonna put this thing in. See this other boom that goes up this way? That's called a derrick. You put the derrick in if you need to reach out further, okay? If you need to go up, if you need to if you need to move something up a long way, you would extend the main boom, okay? Now, the derrick is for doing stuff like that. It's for moving stuff that's far away from the crane base. That's why they put that thing in there. But the derrick can also be used for other things. You got to remember, these cranes, I know this is going to be ironic. These cranes are these lattice cranes are built like a Lego kit. That's why you can build a Lego kit version of it because the cranes are designed to be configured. You can swap parts out. So, like, you could take parts off the derrick, right? And you can add them to this over here if you want. That, that's how Liebherr sells these things. You can buy the entire thing and go, or you can combine parts. 
It's registered in Switzerland. It depends on German. Also depends on how much lifting up close. Yep, yep. So, okay. How does it lift it, Crasher? Counterweight. Now, because the crane is so far away from the initial lift point of that, of that, so that crane over there is called a telescoping crane. This is a telescopic crane. Uh, because it has a crane, the boom is, tel is telescopic. It, zip, it just extends. The lattice cranes need to be assembled. Usually, telescoping cranes, because they're more mobile, it's kind of a more one piece package thing, assemble lattice crawler cranes on site. You need a smaller crane to make your bigger crane. Yes, cranes, they multiply. Can I just say I love watching you nerd out? Yes, that's fine. So, because he's picking the truck up so far away from the main pin, the main pin is the pivot point. You're picking up far away from the pin, you need to run an equal amount of weight, the same distance relatively away from this. Now, keep in mind, the crane can run counterweights in two different spots. You have the saddles right here on the main crane. On This is called the house right here. The house is what holds the pulleys. You know, the pulleys so you can lift stuff up and down, right? It runs the pulleys, and then you also have the saddles on the back. And then you have another pulley for your, for your mast control right here, okay? So the crane operator has multiple pulleys at his disposal and you can even put two pulleys in so you can have two hooks moving up and down individually on the boom it's actually pretty cool now what you can also run back here is the wagon this thing back here is called a wagon okay the wagon holds the counterweight that makes the crane not fall over when it goes to pick this thing up they just they make hydros just as big as the crawlers that's cool some cranes run three hooks there you go mm-hmm are these cranes diesel? There's diesel electric, or diesel hydraulic, excuse me. Diesel hydraulic and electric, right? Please, my last. Okay. Mention technology leave. Oh my God, how much is that? 500 bucks? Oh, that's not a good idea. That's not, Chief, why the frick would you link that? What are you, nuts? No, 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 stop it. So you, you have to run a lot of a lot of weight back here. But see this extension piece right here? That extension piece in some cases is telescopic. So it can move back and forth, right? The thing can move and you can set the distance of your rear counterweights on the wagon away from the pin of the crane to adjust for every lift. Like I said, this thing is a freaking transformer. You can do so much with this. Like lift a starship, for instance. Discovery. Go Business expense. Up. Yeah, exactly. See this thing right here? In some cases, that's telescopic, but he's running a fixed fixed extension with a, with a wagon with no wheels. This is just like the real thing. The real thing is exactly like this. So what, Jackal? You got a problem? Yeah, here. Back it up a little bit. See, he's running one main hook right there, but you can... This crane... These types of cranes are configurable. You can run three or four. If, no, goalie said two, two, three. So there's one right there, and then there's another one. You can have two, two hooks, two sets, so you can move up individually, move up and down. Can you read your last? Sure, Violent, what's up? I do have a legit question, though. These cranes, why are the arms thinner at a joint? Does that not make the crane weak? No. No, it's fine. Guys, you got to understand that the, 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 the way the load is dispersed through the crane... It's not that bad. It looks bad, but it's not. Like you're talking about how, well, I mean, violent, you gotta pivot it somehow. Now these hooks where the crane gets thin, they're built up. Those pins are about this big. Like we're talking 10 centimeters, easily 10 centimeters. They're, they're very big. Those pins are very thick and they won't, they won't break under load. Those pins are designed for what's called shear load. So if you have a, you have a pin and you have a hinge moving on that pin, right, like this, Right, the pin is designed to have load put on it perpendicular. Once again, that's called shearing. These things are perfectly designed for that. In fact, I, I don't know, these might not be hydrostatic. I don't think they are, but sometimes they, they could be. That link shows how the winches work. Oh, right on, dude. Yeah, that's cool, man. See, he's running different, different hooks. Oh, that's so legit. How many trucks to move the counterweights? Well, the, the counterweights are also configurable, Sun Temple. It's the same thing in real life. This is like an exact copy of the real crane. It looks exactly like this. See, there's the two pulleys right there for the twin hooks. 
see the the triangles these counterweights come in 10,000 kilogram increments so you can just configure it you can add more or less counterweight depending on what you're lifting the crane is entirely configurable and the configuration of the crane entirely depends on what you're doing you asked for it now build it on stream i did not i did not i did not oh hi mark so here let's go over here real quick now take a look Let's go to Starship footage here real real fast. This footage, once again, coming from NASA Spaceflight. Oh, oh, look. There we go. Same thing. Literally the same thing. Only just bigger and made out of metal. That's what I mean, man. Finally, this is, this, this is the same thing. It's just you're lifting something that's a little heavier. Now, that's a Libra 11,000 right there. The, the yellow one. And it's being used to lift these sub-assemblies for the wide bay. Look at some of these, look at some of these cranes. So that guy right there, small lattice crane, he's running a little jib, a single jib, jib mass, excuse me. It's outside, you can see how tall it is, yep. Jib mass, yep. See, that's a telescoping crane. But see, the, these telescoping cranes have these stabilizers out there. Those stabilizers are designed to withstand deflection. It triangulates the boom, so the boom doesn't do this. Because you, you have a telescoping crane, it's one single telescope. If it's too long, it's going gonna, it's gonna to deflect. You do not want deflection with a crane. That's why cranes can't pick up, and pick up in the wind. You try to pick up in the wind, the wind takes the thing and tips the crane over. These things out here, these, these telescoping arms on, well, not telescoping, those retractable arms on the side triangulate it and basically turn the boom into a giant trestle. Super lifting. There you go. How much can they lift? It really depends, dude. Uh, it depends on what you're doing. Uh, here, here. You want to see how much they can lift? Watch this. Let's just go right to the very end of this thing, right over here. Look at that crane. That's about as big as you can make one of those cranes. That's a Libra 11350 with a power boom attachment. Now, Violent, you were wondering, like, oh, the pins, they're so thin. What the heck? Look at this crane from a different angle. The one that's all different colors. Take a look. That, that thing has a nice big boy boom on it. That's called a power boom attachment. So he's got a power boom. He's running twin jibs with a boom extension. He's got the derrick up and the mast up. That, that is about as big as you can make that crane. Now, for reference here, the orbital launch tower right here is 500 feet. Uh, let me get that in meters for everybody else. That's 150 meters. That crane is insane. That's ridiculous. And it lifted a starship up no problem. But here's the thing. Look, he's running a wagon out there. You can see the wagon back there. It's, it's kind of hard to see in this picture. But he is running a wagon. He has an extension just like that other crane because starship is freaking huge. Is the crane tethered for support? No. No, not really. With all the counterweights on it, Alistair, that crane weighs easily, I mean, I don't know, million kilos? Easily. Uh, easily. Yeah. But the, the crane is cool because you can take it apart. So you can take all the weight off and then they move the crane in pieces by truck. All these segments get moved by truck, which is cool. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, when they moved that thing up, I mean, look, look at... The, Guys, that thing is that thing's 50 meters tall. It's a 15-story building worth of spaceship. And almost as wide as one. I mean, they're heavy, dude. They they basically overcome the they overcome the tethering problem with weight. Just add more weight to it, it ain't going to move. I worked for a civil engineering company that did some similar stuff, but not quite as large. Yeah, I, know, yeah, I mean, dude, construction is cool, man. Construction is legit. It's very, very cool. Imagine saying, you know, you built this thing 
Like SpaceX doesn't have their own construction company. There's a contract. There's a guy that operates this crane. There's guys just that built this thing, man. That's cool. It, you know, it, it's very interesting. And then this crane's little brother is right here. That's a lever 11,000 11, right there. That's the one that's being used to build the wide bay. It's really cool stuff. If you have a, a million kilo counterweight, does that mean you can lift a million kilos? Yeah, violent, but it depends. So where are you trying to lift? You trying to, you, are you trying to move it sideways or are you trying to lift it up? That depends, that very much depends. Because if you have, a, if you have something that you're just trying to lift up and move, no problem, yeah, run about equal counterweight. But if you're lifting this thing up, right, 70 meters up in the air like that right when that thing is all the way up there that's going to have moment over the boom it's going to swing back and forth you're going to need to run more counterweight than what what starship is you need double the counterweight not double you need a lot more because that thing is going to have more moment it's going to have a lever over the crane boom and you have to make sure that the crane has more leverage over the boom of the crane than the payload does because if you don't you're gonna go to lift it up, the thing's gonna swing from side to side and the crane topples over like, like throwing a Lego. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? Dude, cranes are a rabbit hole. They're, they're insanely cool. I love those things. And while we're here, we might as well check into the Starship news, huh? Let's do it while we're here. How big is the base for that person, for those person lifts on the side? Okay, Ken, same, same thing. The, the man baskets, heavy, heavy, heavy trucks. Heavy trucks. Because you see how far that thing has to reach? Look, you're, if you have just the man basket with a couple of people in it, right? It's not going to be very heavy. 500 pounds, so 250 kilo, 300 kilo, something like that. Not a big deal, right? But you take that 300 kilograms and you move it 100 meters away from the crane, now you have leverage over that. So you need to be able to counteract that leverage force. And the, the way they do that is by making the trucks heavy. They're heavy duty trucks. I'd like to see concept for realistic industrial spaceships one day. Haulers, servicing, fuel tank. Oh, I'm with you on that one, Alex. No problem, Gorthon. Yeah, did I see Jenny's latest tweet? I didn't. Ah, oh, she's taking pictures of Falcon 9. Cool. Yeah, cranes are a rabbit hole, guys. A big rabbit hole. There's a lot of science involved. There's a lot of science involved with lifting stuff and putting it down somewhere else. You'd be surprised. It's very cool. I mean, the physics at its base value is pretty straightforward. You're just picking this thing up and moving it over there. But also, it's a little more complicated than that. you got to take into account windage, how far are you moving it, how far are you moving it up and down? How far are you moving it forward and back? Do you need to turn, right? Are you going to turn left and right? Because if you're going to turn left and right, that means the payload's going to swing. I hope you run more counterweight. There's all kinds of physics involved, right? Even though the, the, the basic task is just picking it up and moving it over there. It's really, really cool. Yeah, I know. Everything's a rabbit hole, Crasher. Everything's more complicated than it always is. It never fails. Could you imagine how much those man lifts sway up at the top of the boost? Oh, geek. Oh, yeah. I hope you have sea legs. Because, yeah, you need it up there. Good news coming out of IXP operations. The boom on the IXP successfully deployed. Nice, Chris. There we go. Here, let's jump into the Starship news while we're here. And watch the cranes when they move it now. Like, guys, l consider this. They moved that super heavy. Not that one. They moved that thing. They picked up that 70 meter tall, that's 220 feet tall booster and put it on the pad. The pad is like five stories off the ground. Think about how complicated of a lift that actually is. It's ridiculous. And guys, we watched it yesterday on Space News and everyone was like, oh, that's kind of cool. I mean, kind of cool would be kind of, kind of underselling it, don't you think? This is the video from yesterday. 
check this out. Yeah, Astro, we're gonna play Summer Car after this. <laughs> no, you wanna talk about rabbit holes? That's a rabbit hole, man. Bigger than cranes. Look. Oh, that's, look at, dude, look at how much counterweight this guy has in the saddles, man. Each one of these triangular things is 10,000 kilos. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. That guy has 30 counterweights, 15 on each saddle. So, fifth, so 30 times 10,000. That guy has 30, 300,000 kilograms of counterweight in this, in this configuration. So if you don't understand kilograms, that's 660,000 pounds. Yeah, I know. Crazy, right? He's running 300 tons of counterweight. <laughs> that's insane, man. And that right there should give you more or less a good idea how heavy that freaking thing is. EJ, counterweight does not really help with swing. Well, it depends on the lift, Katri. You, it really depends on what you're doing, doesn't it? But also, yeah, you don't want deflection because that then the, then the boom can do this, and you're right. That's no good. Yeah, that has no fuel in it. Mm -hmm. Look at, bro, look at that. That is nuts. Okay, another thing to note is look at how much this thing is bending. The house of the crane right there is bending. It's it's down like this. This is lower to the ground. Yeah, no. Jay, construction, lifting construction safety 101. Do not ever, ever stand underneath suspended payload. Ever. Ever. Don't ever do that. <laughs> Never. <laughs> that's, that's not even OSHA. That's just don't be a... This is why the crane's pl uh, pl places need to be compacted beforehand. Yep. Can you imagine? They have to grade the terrain out and you have to level it for the crane to get in there. Can you imagine how much weight is being put on those tracks? Don't... Do you see any of these guys standing underneath it? Hell no. These guys are a long way away. And they got the wires here to make sure that it doesn't sway. Those, these guys with the wires are there to... these. Sl they're not slide wires. I forget what they're called. They're there to make sure that the thing doesn't do this. No, I wouldn't stand underneath that. Nope, not even close. I would stay 30 feet away, just like the, about 10 meters away, just like those guys. I'm not even, oh, hell no. Taglines, that's what they're called, thank you. Another thing to note, guys, if we back it up a little bit here. So, the, look at the operator's booth on the crane. The operator's booth is actually joining. If you look at it, so when the crane is being stored, it actually folds off to the side, but the operator can actually tilt the house. He can tilt the uh, the operator's booth up so he can look up at the payload that he's moving around instead of looking, trying to look out the glass like this. Crazy, huh? That dude, the, the cranes are amazing. It's so damn cool. They make me so happy. Like, look at that thing. This thing is just freely manipulating a 300 ton stainless steel rocket and it's manhandling it like it's no problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no camera on top? No. No, you have you have sensors up there. <sighs> That's insane. That's insane. How much can you do as a person with, to counter the swing with the cables they have? You'd be surprised, Violent. Those guys with the tag lines are damping out, making sure the thing doesn't sway. Because Katra's right. You don't want you don't want deflection. So if the payload isn't perfectly coplanar with the boom like this at all times, ha! Right? If it goes this way, it's gonna twist the boom. Torsion, torsional load, and torsional load is very bad for those pins. The pins down here like I was telling you dude you remember they're designed for compression they're not designed to be twisted they'll break don't do that 
But even see something small like this man basket right here, you see how heavy and chonky it is to move the basket around? It's just, it's just, just leverage, man. But look, see, see how the, the booth is tipped up so the guy can see what he's doing? That's really cool, man. This is really neat. Oh, that's great, Core. You're my most watched streamer in 2021. What's my prize? You get a pat on the back. See, the Legos are, that's the cool part about the Legos, man. It's the same thing, only just on a smaller scale, but it's the physics don't change. Oh, oh man, that's freaking cool. Oh, I could watch this all day. Holy rocket engines. Uh, Elon, how many rocket engines do you want? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. I mean, on the booster, yes. So you want, yes, rocket engines on the booster. Yes, precisely. Crazy, huh? This is what I mean, man. The rockets are fascinating, and you guys know that's my number one. But the stuff that makes the rockets and the stuff that... The stuff that built this thing is is fascinating to me too. Like I like seeing the end-to-end -end solution. How did we go from a freaking grass field to Starship Orbital Launch Complex? I'm interested in that journey and I'm interested in the equipment that got us there because that's all part of the equation. They're not the most powerful Wolfie, but they're Raptor engines don't put out the most amount of thrust. They're putting about, they're putting out about a third of what a Saturn V F1 engine would put out. But here's the thing: the Raptor engines are putting out about a third of third of the thrust, but they're like a third as light. These Raptor engines have insanely high power to weight ratio. So think of it like a turbocharged inline six it's very light for what it is but you can make v8 power with it the the raptor engines they don't they're not the most powerful engines around but their power to weight ratio is very good and good specific impulse yep they're making uh about somewhere between 350 and 380 depending on the version of raptor 380 second specific impulse so that that doesn't that really has more to do with your propellants than anything. 380 is still very good for a methane engine. That's really good. But you really theoretically can't get above 380 with methane because chemistry. <laughs> You're getting to the limit of the physics engine there. 350 sea level. Oh yeah. No, 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 no. Z Zian. 380 sea level guys sea level raptors are ridiculous when i when i say i don't just sit here and swoon over elon musk's creation for no reason i'm not just a blind fanboy i understand exactly what that thing is doing and it that that's what makes it even more fascinating to me 330 sea level 380 vac thank you ian 380 is the r vac okay so you're making 330 sea level sorry i sorry i was wrong i got a little hyped up got a little hyped up but still i mean 330 sea level is still ridiculous Considering the Saturn V F1 engines, the five that are in the Saturn V, those make, what was it, 230, 250 second specific impulse at sea level? These engines are insane. They're, they're very, very good. Sounds stupid, but do you think it's possible to put together, to put, to strap together three or four boosters together in a triangle square configuration? And why would you don't do that? Uh, it's because Starship is designed to be a full reusable system, Baz. Think about it like this. Okay, you see that right there, right? That thing is like having five smaller boosters just kind of all put into one. The idea is that the idea is that you don't need to put boosters on it. You see how many rocket engines are on that thing? There's 29 on that one. That is all the boosters. That's five of like, that That thing has, let's see. Okay, so let me put it into perspective. A Falcon 9 has about nine mega newtons, 10 mega newtons of thrust at liftoff if it's like block five. That thing has 50, 50, 50 mega newtons of, of liftoff thrust, which is about 15 million pounds of thrust. 
That, that is the side boosters, man. That's the side boosters, and then the side boosters, and then the side boosters. You'd need a Falcon Heavy with five cores to even get close to that thrust. That's double the Saturn V. Like I said, I don't swoon over this stuff for nothing. RS-25 or Raptor? I'll take the Raptor. RS-25s are good, but Raptors are the, Raptors are the future. RS-25s are good for their time, and I still like them a lot. They're good... They were good for the space shuttle. They're decent for SLS, but yeah. So Violent, this one has 29, and booster the two boosters after it have 29. Uh, and then somewhere down the production line, I think it's booster 7 or booster 8, they switch to 33. There's 13 engines on the thrust plate, which is just, all right. On the center thrust plate, and then 20 on the outer ring, which is, okay. Yeah, zero. It's going to be... I really feel bad for anything that's going to be down here when this thing lights. Because you... <laughs> yeah, maybe there... Zero, now that I'm really thinking about it, maybe there's a good reason why SpaceX do, it doesn't have a flame deflector. Really, anything that's down there is going to get obliterated. Flame deflector or not. Like... Yeah, I guess when you're making... When you're making 50 mega newtons of thrust, does a flame deflector matter? Just throw water at it and hopefully it works. I think they're going to end up with a flame crater. Like, what? What? what yeah, dude... 39A, 39A's flame deflector would have trouble keeping up with this. 39A's flame deflector is made was designed for the Nova rockets, which is 8 F1s, which is Actually no, 39A could take this, but it's at the upper end of 39A's performance. 39A was designed for Saturn Nova. That's why the flame trenches are so damn big. They're, Saturn V, believe it or not, is under-engineered for pad 39A. They built those pads to be used for much bigger rockets. They did that on purpose because they were anticipating the Apollo program needing a much heavier lifter down the road when we've colonized the moon and Mars. <sighs> Never mind, it's in the past. Uh, so those flame deflectors were really designed for Nova, which has eight F1 engines in it. So. The F1 engine makes about 6,700 kilonewtons of thrust, or I think it's 1.5 million pounds per uh, per engine. So let's just round up. Say it's 7,000 kilonewtons of thrust. Seven times eight. So 56. So yeah, 39A could take it. Yeah, it'd be just fine. Yeah, it'd be okay. But that's pretty much the only one. Yeah, any other pad, you tried to light one of these at pad 40, it would destroy the pad instantly. There's no freaking way. And maybe maybe that's why they didn't put a flame deflector down there, because they're... Yeah, whatever you put down there, is, you're not getting back. Saturn C8, my beloved. Nova never happened, Gorthon. Yeah. Nova was Saturn V 2.0. It was... So that's the Saturn V. Keep in mind, these drawings aren't exactly accurate. That's the Saturn V right there with five F F1 engines. The Nova had eight engines. It was a Saturn VIII. This is, this is what they built 39A and the VAB for. They're built for this. Saturn V was just an interim thing. Or at least it was supposed to be. You need to have a time machine, or I mean, police box, or a DeLorean. I'll take the DeLorean, that's fine. Yeah, N Super Heavy will have about the same as this. Maybe a little bit more in the 33 engine configuration. It looks like the Sea Dragon. <laughs> yeah. They don't have permission to launch Starship just yet, but close. It should be by the end of the year, so that's not that far away. Anyway. There's your spiel on cranes and starships. Let's see what's up. Let's see what's up in the new video. 
Yeah, of course, Jim. Duh. I don't think the stock PRV engine can get up to 88 miles an hour with this with the DeLorean. Even Doc Brown would have had to hop that thing up a little bit. Would Nova have had the same third stage? Oh. <sighs> Nova would have had eight F1 engines in the first stage. And Ian, you correct me if I'm wrong on this. If I'm remembering correctly, this right here would have had five M1 Hydrolox engines. M1 engines are a hydrogen version of F1 engines. And then the third stage would have probably been something similar to uh, S4B. Yeah, they, they were gonna switch these engines to a Hydrolox version and put them in the second stage. So first and second stage engines would be come more or less off the same production line, kind of like Falcon 9. Yeah, M1. Here, M1 rocket engine. The M1 was a vacuum optimized version of the Saturn V F1. The Saturn V F1 was already gigantic. The M1 is literally like three stories tall. This is where the Apollo program was going. And now you realize why I have a huge phobia of any space program getting canceled because they all can scale in some way, shape, or form. Maybe except for the space shuttle, but that's another story. Look at that thing. Yeah, nuts. I don't know how they would have made that thing work. Yeah, 40 to one expansion ratio, that, yeah, okay. I don't know how that would have worked. That, that, that would have been nuts. <laughs> ridiculous it would have been it would have been insane it would have been absolutely nuts chamber pressure yes evil peter beck be like what's that swish oh god no no don't do dude, dude, no no james webb jokes about it breaking please <laughs> please don't do that <laughs> still going you wish they dump more money into the space program they are hosing yeah, they, dude, NASA's getting billions of bucks to get SLS going, and, you know, SLS is not the best starting architecture, but it's better than nothing. And at, But the best part is, at the same time, we have these guys doing their thing, too. Oh, so think about it like this. We're in a unique scenario where we have not one Saturn V-styled vehicle, so a super heavy lifter. We have two super heavy launch vehicles being engineered right now. One of them is completely reusable. Yes. Yes. It's on the 24th, Violent. New Glenn is not a super heavy launch vehicle, but New Glenn can get honorable mention there. That's just fine. Yeah, New Glenn's gonna be beast mode when that thing comes out. Seven meter payload fairing, 70 tons to orbit. I think it was 70 tons, or was it 50? No, it's 50, 50, 50, 50. I'm getting it confused with block one SLS. Green, no, blue, ah! It's still insane, oh man, look at that. That's, she's a beast, she is an absolute unit. Yeah, I wasn't, I'm with you. Guys, there's never been so many launch vehicles being developed in human history. We are literally, we've literally surpassed the point in the Cold War when everybody was just trying to make missiles to shoot at each other. Guys, there's more civilian launch vehicles flying today. There's more commercial launch vehicles than there is ICBMs by a long shot. I mean, think about all these different startup companies and all the commercial companies and SpaceX is kind of spearheading that whole thing with blue right behind them and, and Relativity, Launcher, uh, there's ABL, there's you know, uh, Astra, what, doing what they're doing. There's Rocket Lab. There, there, there's a bajillion of them that I forget all of them. There's Virgin Galactic. You know, there's, uh, I mean, I even forgot all the freaking names, man. Mastin is working on stuff. Northrop Grumman has Antares. Like, there's just so much. It's so cool to see it. It's so cool. Oh yeah, those guys, yeah, Firefly, yeah. Yeah, those guys are pretty cool. Yeah, that yeah, Firefly's pretty good. Yo, they're getting ready for their second test soon, Ren. 
Strato launch is a thing. Yes, Strato launch actually got a government contract to launch hypersonic drone targets. True story. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, Foz, I'm not even getting into what the Europeans, the the uh, Russians, the Chinese, I'm, uh, Japan. Japan's building the new rocket, building an H3. I'm not. E I haven't even gotten into what those guys are doing. Like, that's just the U.S. It's everywhere. It's freaking nuts, man. It's a space renaissance. And it's being spearheaded by NASA and this guy. What is that? Dynamic load simulator. Also, look at that telescoping crane. She's a boost. So what this thing is designed to do, it's a big hydraulic press, if you really want to know. There's that cap up at the top, and that cap has a bunch of ropes on it, and the ropes attach to the hydraulics down here. And basically the hydraulics compress, and they pull that cap down. It's, it's a big hydraulic press. At this gigantic hydraulic press, so today we have a starship at test article. It is really scary, so we must deal with it. Yes, it's very, very good. Good, we're going to crush Discovery. the... No Holy not. frick, it exploded! <laughs> Sorry, I love that channel. Those guys are the best. Where's your American water-powered rocket, huh? We Europeans have one. Yeah, I can make one in my backyard, Swishio. Where's your starship? <laughs> What's that, Atmana? 74 months. Messier 74. Phantom Galaxy. Dope. Ah, uh, SpaceX joining gigantic hydraulic press. Actually, NASA. NASA was the first one to do it. Here, check this out. At Marshall Space Flight Center, guys, they have a gigantic hydraulic press that they presses that they used for crushing the SLS's tank. Headphone users. Be careful. Oh, that didn't look right. I think something's gone wrong. Does that mean it's not coming on then? Actually, this they did that on purpose, first of all. They, they weren't like, hmm, that's, oh! <laughs> no, they did that on purpose. And you know what's crazy? They held this tank at pressure with nitrogen inside, right? You use nitrogen because you don't want a reactive force in there because when you compress a gas, it gets hot. And if you have something like hydrogen and you compress it and it gets hot, you Hindenburg. Don't Hindenburg. Bad idea. So they use nitrogen in there. They predicted the failure rate of this tank with a 3% deviation, which is unreal. They held, they predicted that this tank, after three hours being held at 260% of its rated load, so it has 2.6 times the force pushing down on this thing that it's designed for when it's, this is the hydrogen tank, when it's going up on the rocket, they predicted that it would fail after three hours. It failed after three hours and like three minutes. Unbelievable, unbelievable quantification with math. That's ridiculous. That's really good engineering. It doesn't get better than that. 3% deviation on the engineering. That, that SLS is good. <laughs> that, well, if, if, you know, when SLS launches, you know that the hydro, hydrogen tank buckling ain't going to be the problem. <laughs> Just on a side note. The last 3% jackal is the hardest to get at, man. 3% is plenty good. That's just fine. Trust me on that one, dude. But Hinden but the Hindenburg looks so cool burning up. Well, see, Crownless, that's the that's the that's the benefit here. Rockets look cool when they launch. It's kind of doing the same thing as a Hindenburg, but it's taking it and forcing it through a nozzle. Yeah. It's kind of the same thing though. I mean, rock you say rockets don't look cool when they launch? I mean, Kind of the same thing. Fast fire. Okay, gotcha. 
It's the crown, crown, it's my rule, okay? If a rocket is exploding in one direction, everything is working just fine. If your rocket is exploding in multiple directions, something is wrong. You should probably try flipping it on and off again, because that's not working how you want it to work. Hindenburg, but with purpose. Exactly. Yes, yes. Three percent is five point four minutes, not three minutes. Leave, yeah, leave it to you to do the math out, you putz. Yeah, pretty much, Wolfie. Yep, yep. Yeah, I know, Acton. I know what you mean. That's the bottom side, then, right? Yeah, the the one with the tiling on it, with what looks like subway tiles. Yeah, that that's yes. This is the. This is the side that's going to get hot. Yes. Thank Python for the math. I'm sorry, Jay, I'd have to take the blue police blocks anyway. Yeah, but it's a DeLorean. Good, you're the way I see it. If you're gonna build a time machine, why not do it with some style? The M1, yeah, JM, yep. I was telling people about Nova. Oh, what could have been? But hey, 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 I'll take this. I'll take this and SLS. I'm not greedy. This is fine. We can... This this and SLS flying together is perfect. That's fine. That's good enough. I'll swap that for Nova. That's good. That's okay. I'm totally fine with that. Oh, okay, Kramlis. I got you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this is 21, right? So, the painter's tape right there is to hold tiles together that they've glued. SpaceX would, why, now why would they glue stuff and then also mechanically adhere stuff? Well, it's probably because of differential heating. You're gonna get differential thermal expansion in certain spots, and a spot where you'd want more, where you'd have more thermal expansion, like on the nose cone, right? The, you, you, the glue gives the tiles a little bit more leeway to move around. They do move around a little bit. That's why they have a little bit of a guide there or a little bit of a shim between the tiles because if you butt the tiles up together when starship goes through re-entry the tiles will add, the 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 hull of starship is going to heat up obviously and it's going to expand when stuff heats up it expands and when if the tiles were up against each other and the starship hull would expand right they'd butt up against each other and pop off it's th that's something they learned during the shuttle program uh, well, even before the shuttle program, they knew that was going to happen before they even flew a shuttle. Uh, that's why the tiles have like a little bit of a shim in between them, like maybe five or six mil. Very, very small. Like, I don't know, a quarter of an inch? Something really tiny. Because when Starship heats up, those tiles, it'll expand and those tiles will end up buttoning up against each other. But I think that some of them are glued in some spots versus mechanically adhered in other spots because... Uh, differential thermal expansion. Some, long story short, some parts of the vehicle are going to get hotter than the others, and the glue, you know, you got to boil it so the glue gets soft. In some areas that gets hotter, the glue affords the tiles to be able to move around a little bit more. All of the space shuttle tiles were glued for what it's worth. But EJ, the blue police box can go to space. You're comparing an interdimensional ship with a with a time machine, Hoodger. It's a false equivalency, bro. It's a false equivalency. That's like saying, oh, what's your favorite plane? Oh, my favorite plane's a P-51. Oh, well, mine's an F-22, and it could beat a P-51 in battle. No, that, yeah, no, yeah, no crap. Duh. False equivalency. How dare you? How dare you? <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> How dare you? Does Tough Rock expand when heated? A little bit, crownless. Everything expands when heated, man. Everything. That's just physics. Even you. That's weird. Anyway. 
You ever been in a sauna, man? You're just like, ah, satana, ah, el vete, satana. You just kind of lay out. Not water. What do you mean, not water? What the hell is evaporation, then? What, evaporation is just some magical gumdrop thing that happens when you heat water? I expand when eating. Yeah, me too. Me too. Water expands when it freezes. You're frozen. Yeah, sure. What's up, Violent? I have another legitimate question. If you pressurize something like a rocket and the pressure holds, why does it break after that break after three minutes? I mean, it holds, right? Metal fatigue. Metal fatigue, dude. Violent SLS is made out of aluminum or al aluminium for other people, right? It's made out of aluminum. It's actually not far off from this green soda can that I have that you guys can't see. You ever you ever take this thing right here? And do this. You fatigue the metal over time. That's part of the reason why SLS can only be fueled up so many times before the metal fatigues. You're gonna hit fatigue for holding it at an overpressure, 260% of rated load for a long period of time. Eventually the aluminum is just gonna be like, what are you doing? And just pop. Uh, a long time ago, dude. About a, almost a year ago. Nuclear? Yeah, I got a green screen. I still have my orange screen though. Yeah, it's gonna micro fracture. Aluminum, aluminum under load, under stress, cracks like rocks. Stress fractures. Oh yeah, you see it on airplanes all the time. Here, I'll show you. So if you look at certain parts of a 737's wing, uh, certain parts of a 737's wing, if you're ever flying, might have that. See that? There's a part of the wing that they cut off, or the flap, that's part of the Fowler flap that they cut. They cut it because it, it fractured. The aluminum started to get micro stress cracks in it from being under load because it's the flap, it's deflecting a lot of air. So you, you can't, aluminum is tough to repair, okay? It, it's, a difficult, it's difficult to repair, so you know what they do? They just cut it off, amputate. Can't have stress fractures if the part that fractures doesn't exist. Yeah, you see that all the time in commercial aviation. I, I remember I was reading about this one time because I was flying in a plane and I saw that a piece of the, the flap was missing and I'm like, ah, okay. That's not good. And then I read about it. I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense. But yeah, aluminum does crack under load, which is interesting. You wouldn't think, but it cracks like rocks. Almost. It's not, it's a little more complicated than that because it's not, it's not a rock, it's metal. But then again, rocks are just a bunch of metals kind of all put together and a bunch of other things all put together. Two hundred and sixty percent rated flight roads. Exactly. I have a question about closed cycle engines. Since you're putting your pump exhaust back into the combustion chamber, that has to be a higher chamber pressure than the combustion chamber exhaust. I know that the RL10 gets away with this by having a low chamber pressure, and most big closed cycle engines have booster pumps. I know that the RS25's low pressure hydrogen pump was expander powered, but what about a closed expander cycle with high chamber pressure? Okay, Jam, that's a good question. It's a tough one, but it's a good question. The RL10 gets around it by having low chamber pressure to be able to have the expander cycle have a higher differential pressure than the combustion chamber, right? Long story short, the thing that the, the, the mechanism that feeds the fuel has a higher pressure than the engine's pressure. That way it feeds the fuel so you don't get backflow. For a closed cycle engine, same thing. 
you best be making sure that your expander or whatever you're using to keep the thing closed cycle has a higher chamber pressure than your rocket engine. Or else it's going to backfeed. And if it backflows, mm, it's not a good idea. And I know what people are going to say. Oh, well, EJ, isn't there like a pressure regulator or a check valve? No. Putting a valve in the way of the propellants going into the rocket engine is just going to make more problems. You kind of have to... It's like... It's like damming up a river. Not going to work very well. Uh, the, turbo pump, the turbo pump outlet pressure needs to be higher than the chamber pressure on both sides. Oh yeah, or else you're not rocket engineering today. <laughs> and, and if the rocket engine hard starts or backfires, you're not engineering today or tomorrow or, or a couple months into the future because your engine is a crater. This stuff's difficult, man. It's tough. Now, like, think about... JM, think about SpaceX. That Raptor engine is approaching 300 bar chamber pressure. Can you imagine the pressure coming out of the turbo pumps going into that engine? Unbelievable. Unbelievable amounts of force here. It's ridiculous. It's not fiction. We didn't make it up. It's not a total fabrication. Nuts, right? Would Starship survive re-entry if one tile is missing? It's possible singularity because of how Starship how Starship moves through re-entry. It's not going to move through re-entry exactly the same as as the shuttle did. Uh, so, check this out. This old NASA footage. This old NASA picture can show you. Tell you. I'll tell you. Blah, 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 I'll speak another language here for a second. Ah. Um, this should tell you everything you need to know. So this is a crap picture. The picture is potato, but it'll 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 show you what what you need to know. So the shuttle, the shuttle kind of goes through kind of like this. Th these are just different shapes for reentry. Capsules go through like this. See that? Missile nose cones like that. Now, how much heating you have? entirely depends on how close your hypersonic boundary layer is to the vehicle. Long story short, capsules don't have a heat shield on the sides, right? But they have a heat shield on the bottom. So this particular type of reverse conic shape favors heating down here, okay? The shuttle is kinda like this over here. I, I could get you a better picture of what shuttle re-entry looks like. Um, The shuttle's kind of like that. Now take a look. What side does the shuttle have the black tiles on? The bigger parts of the thermal protection system. Well, it's on the bottom. That's why. See how close the boundary layer is? Now, what's the boundary layer? It's a literally plasma. It's plasma that's accumulated up on the vehicle. Now, a, re a, a thermal protection system on a rocket its job is to either resist that plasma or push it away. The shuttle pushes it away. That's why the hit shuttle's heat shield is reusable. It shoots it out off to the sides. And all you have to do is worry about how close it gets to the vehicle. Starship is going to kind of do something like this, but it's a little bit different. And that's where these shapes come, come involved here. The blunt body concept. Starship isn't going to re-enter at a low angle like this. It's going to re-enter 90 degrees perpendicular to its re-entry heat. So if this is the Starship right here, that's the nose cone right in the center. And then the flappy wings would be out here. You see how, f you see this type of system favors your boundary layer being further away. You see how far that is away? The reason is because air gets compressed up against the, the hemisphere here. The Russians actually figured this out. Believe it or not, Vostok. Vostok was a spherical capsule, and that's how they figured this out. The problem is you don't have much attitude control when your capsule is a sphere. Starship is basically going to do this, and it's going to keep that boundary layer away from it. So if that's the case, you might be able to lose a couple of tiles, but I still wouldn't count on it. Now, Starship is made out of stainless, right? It's made out of stainless, and stainless can withstand a little bit of a higher temperature than the space shuttle or a capsule's aluminum, right? So the aluminum capsules technically have to carry a bigger thermal protection system, i.e. if you made the shuttle out of aluminum, the tiles would need to be thicker, way thicker, because aluminum can't, can't absorb that much heat before it melts. 
Aluminum is very strong, if, but if you heat it, it's not very strong. It turns into butter real quick. Stainless can take the heat a little bit more, and it disperses the heat kind of better. Aluminum is better. Can, you can move heat around a lot better with aluminum. So the stainless steel, think about it, it kind of like stays in one area. But also, you don't want that when you're when you when you have reentry. Say if you miss if you have a tile missing, the heat's just going to stay there. It's going to stay in that area, and it's going to take that stainless steel, and it'll melt it. So it really depends on where the tile is. I think if SpaceX lost a tile during reentry, like right here, you might be okay. Maybe it, but I would say the plan is probably to not lose tiles during reentry. Yeah, that's probably the better way to do that. But you don't know until you go. That's why SpaceX is, wants to shoot the Starship off into space because they're testing the tiles. All they're testing over the last six months, guys, has been about te has been about testing those tiles. I just sent you a PDF. It's about I, I know all about that, Mac. The, the believe it or not, the problem with Columbia wasn't the tiles. It was the reinforced carbon carbon. The RCC on the space shuttle is the thing that I'm talking about that's designed to move the plasma away. The tiles are this just there to make sure the aluminum doesn't melt. But the space shuttle's the space shuttle's real big one. The real big thing with the shuttle is the nose cone and the wing leading edges. So if we look at Columbia right here, see this kind of gray part right here? That and then the wing leading edge right there. Those are the big ones. That's designed to just straight up push the plasma out and away. Think of it like a boat hull almost. Same idea, only going Mach 25. Because when you're going Mach 25, physics starts to get a little weird. Air compresses up against this and it divides by zero because the compression gets so high that it starts fusing things and creates plasma. You get phase change from gas to plasma, which is pretty, pretty dope. That's pretty freaking cool. And then the nose cone on the shuttle is just designed to move that plasma out and away from the shuttle. The tiles are just there to make sure that everything else doesn't melt. But Columbia, unfortunately, lost some of the, the gray. They lost some of the reinforced carbon carbon, so there was no place for the plasma to go but through the shuttle. Not a good thing. But yeah, I know all about it, Mac. Yeah, it sucks. But yeah, Starship could probably lose tiles. Nice Kenworth, by the way. Uh... It, but it really depends on where it is, dude. That's the big one. I agree, Jim. What is the grade on stainless steel? Uh, Clayton, this is 304, uh, 304X or 30X stainless steel. It's a variant of 304. SpaceX's own in-house creation. Yeah, heating doesn't re-entry heating doesn't happen from friction. It's from atmospheric compression. Basically, the thing hits the air so ridiculously fast that the air doesn't know what to do. It's just like, all right, and then it just pops. Yeah, it's nuts. Reentry is so ridiculous. It's it's the fact that we figured that out in the first place is just all right. I wish we could make expander cycles bigger. You can make expander cycles bigger, T man, but there's always a theoretical limit. It depends on your propellants. It depends on your propellants and the air, the surface area that your cold propellants are getting exposed to when your engine starts up. With an expander cycle, you're limited by surface area because so much liquid hydrogen can only cool so much engine. But yeah, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's the gist of it. RS-25E test today. We watched it, Novus. Oh yeah, we watched that live, dude. We'll do it live. Frick it. It looked like an ascent profile loaded in because they, they started her up, up to 111, down to 60, back up to 111 for a long time and then ramped off and then they shut it off. 300 bar is 4350 PSI. Yeah, Katra, I know. <laughs> I didn't know that. I don't know the conversion off the top of my head, but isn't that nuts? Once again, cranes, violent. You see the crane? Look at that thing. Look at that. that that's, that's pretty good. Would you say its melting point is 14 to 15, 14, 1400 to 1450? I'm not sure, Clayton. I'm sure it's designed to be able to withstand something hard. I think Elon said 800C from the stainless steel by itself. 
which is, Clayton, that's the reason why Super Heavy doesn't have any tiles. Because with the stainless steel, you don't need it. Stainless steel will straight up resist the heat. It'll st- it, it, it's fine. That's why people use it to cook things. Because <laughs> it withstands the heat. What crane? That beast mode of a crane right there. Lavi, 10 month resub. Thank you. Oh, okay, or not. Good to know. Let's fix it. How about I fly out there? We fix your thing. We fix your car. The stainless steel can withstand, oh, I don't know. Probably, I think it's like almost three times the temperature that that aluminum can take. So what, what is that? What do you mean? What do you mean it can take the temperature? Well, when you heat up something, it goes to a critical mass. When it gets a critical mass, it basically starts melting. It, it, long story short, it can only absorb so much heat before it just... Right? So if I had uh, like, uh, like a square inch cube of aluminum and a square inch cube of stainless steel and you heated up both of them with the same blowtorch, right? The, the aluminum would melt way before the stainless steel would. Way before it. Stainless steel shuttle, you're looking at one, T-Man. Changes phase. Yeah, crownless. It'll turn to a liquid. Metal will turn to liquid if it absorbs too much energy. <laughs> Just like if you heat up water. Water can only take so much heat before it turns to steam. But water doesn't instantly turn to steam either. If you ever cook noodles, you put a pot on the stove, you turn the heat up, the heat comes a lot faster, right? It's not like the stove takes a second to heat up, but it takes a second to put all that heat into the water. The water can absorb the heat, but once it gets past 100 C, it doesn't absorb the heat anymore and it changes phase to a gas. It's basic, basic, basic chem here, guys. But it's cool. It's good to it's good to get refreshers into this stuff. It keeps you sharp. What if you had a super reinforced front? Then once you punch through most of the heat like a bullet, then you focused on the surface areas to slow down and control. Keep in mind I'm trying to understand, but don't. Let, let me read it again, Revival. Give me one second. What if you had a super reinforced front? Then once you punch through most of the heat, i.e. like a bullet. Then you, well, bullets actually melt when you shoot them out of a gun. Yeah, but I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to bear with you, hero. I'll, I'll make you understand this. I got you. Then you focus on the surface areas to slow, to slow and control. That's basically what the shuttle did, dude. You just described the shuttle reentry. That's what I'm trying to tell you guys. So this thing right there, see the nose cone revival? That punches through the, that punches through reentry heating. It punches the air, literally, going Mach 25, like 20,000 miles an hour. And that thing, that reinforced carbon-carbon, can straight up resist the reentry heat. RCC is heavy. That's why you don't just coat the whole damn shuttle in RCC. I mean, they could have. It would have been a lot heavier. RCC is a lot heavier, but it can straight up resist, resist reentry heating. This thing can take 3,500C, no problem. It won't melt. It's basically rocks. Who knew? I mean, even the tiles on the shuttle. But that's basically, you just described basically what the shuttle does. During re-entry, the, the, during re-entry, the wings aren't really doing much. You're not going to use your control surfaces during re-entry. Bad idea. That's a real good way to melt the, melt the wing off. They're using the, the control thrusters during re-entry. And then... Then, once the shuttle gets out of the fiery stuff, they use the control surfaces. But the shuttle up here, if you look at the rudder, the rudder is also a speed brake. So the rudder on the shuttle is two control surfaces. It can do this, it can do this, right? But it can also do that. And then the shuttle had flaps, just like a regular airplane. But it was just one flap and it was just at the back. See this little guy right here, that little thing sticking out? It's called the body flap. They can slow it down with the body flap and the speed brake. You deploy the body flap down and you deploy the speed brake, shuttle turns into a giant, giant badminton shuttlecock. Seriously, same idea. Pretty cool, huh? But yeah, you basically just described the shuttle re-entry. This thing punches through the re-entry. The tiles are only there to make sure that the shuttle doesn't melt. So even the shuttle, during some re-entries, they lost some tiles. STS-27, they, they almost lost, they almost lost it, but... You can lose some tiles, but not a lot. But if you lose the RCC with the shuttle, that's game. You're not coming back down. Stay up there. <laughs> if you can. Ah. 
How many sonic booms do you get if you're going Mach 25? Well, Violet, sonic boom doesn't depend on speed. It depends on shape. With the shuttle, here. The answer is right here. How many sonic booms do you think the shuttle makes? Now, for the people that know, don't say anything. Violent, look at this picture. Tell me how many sonic booms you think the shuttle makes. For history, explain why the American flag is facing backwards, because we always fly stars into the wind. Two. One on the nose and one on the wing. Bingo. See this? One and two. Boom, boom. Twin sonic booms. There you go. You guys got to understand. Different vehicles. Vehicles technically, when they're breaking the sound barrier, have thousands of sonic booms. There's just certain sonic booms that are more audible than others. The reason is because speed of sound isn't localized to one vehicle. There's not one vehicle. Okay, we're flying. We're flying this this airplane. Okay, sound barrier. All right, we're good. No, no, that's not how that works. The speed of sound is very fluid. All right, and it has to do with different parts of the vehicle breaking the speed of sound. And that has entirely to do with air speed, okay? How fast the air is moving over different parts of the plane. Now, anybody that knows anything about basic lift. So what, is a, what does a wing do? A wing creates differential pressure, right? On the bottom of the wing, you have air at very low speed at very high pressure and it compresses underneath the wing. That's why wings are a teardrop shape that's kind of bent down. On top of the wing, you have air moving at extremely high speed, but at extremely low pressure. So what part of the wing is gonna break the sound barrier first? The top. Why? Because the air naturally just moves faster over it. Because it's a wing. <laughs> That's why that that's where you get the transonic regime. So transonic is anything from 0.8 Mach to 1.2 Mach. That's called transonic. So there's subsonic, transonic, and then supersonic. And then past Mach 5 is hypersonic. That's when stuff starts getting hot. That's what re-entry stuff is over in hypersonics, right? So it has entirely to, everything to do with how the air is moving over different parts of the thing that's flying. That's very important to understand. You can have, that's why it's called transonic, because you can have part of your plane breaking the sound barrier. On the top of the wing, the speed of sound can be broken. And then on the bottom of the wing, it's not, you're still subsonic, hence transonic. So technically a vehicle, anytime you have differential, not, long story short, different parts of the vehicle can break the sound barrier over the other parts. And then once you get into supersonics, you're hearing the sonic booms from a thousand different parts of the vehicle, but some the thing is, is that some parts of the vehicle are more audible than others. Falcon 9 technically has like a thousand sonic booms, but you only hear three. You hear the engines, you hear the, the landing legs breaking the sound barrier, and then you hear the grid fins, the ba ba pow when, this, when Falcon 9 comes back and lands. The shuttle, you only hear two because the wing and the nose cone are the most audible. But Here's the other thing. You want, to, you want to hear something even crazier? Somebody already mentioned it in chat. Sonic booms are directional, and that is entirely dependent on the shape of the plane and what direction, like a speaker almost, you're, you're listening to. This is why we don't, or you're listening from, right? This is why we don't hear sonic booms when the rocket goes up. You'd have to be above the rocket to hear the sonic boom because the sonic boom goes forward. That, but as opposed to when the shuttle was, would come back for re-entry, the shuttle's coming down at us, so you hear the sonic boom. Or Falcon 9 coming down in for a landing. You hear it because it's it's breaking the sound barrier in our general direction. Falcon has an infinite amount of booms, Funky Flex, which is crazy. Yeah, here. Uh, there's another way that I can kind of... Visu that you can visualize this here. T-38 sound... Take a look. So this is NASA imagery of a T-38 breaking the sound barrier. How many, how many, how many booms do you think you'd hear from this thing? There's the sonic booms, Gagan. Yeah. One. Six. 
Would you hear six if this plane flew over? No, you'd hear one big one. But technically, you'd hear if you were if you really had some good sense. I don't even know if you'd be able to hear it. If you had some good audio recording equipment, you could hear one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, and then fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Because this is the the gases are slowing down. This is coming from the the wake effects from from the uh, from the boundary layer. It's nuts, dude. It's absolutely insane. Yeah, but so, once again, some are more audible than others. It really depends on the shape. Yeah, crazy, right? Sound barrier is cool, man. That's why aerodynamics are tough because there's a lot of weird stuff going on. And don't get me wrong, fellas, I ain't an expert. Talk to somebody that that's taken aero classes. This is just what I've learned. Uh, I'm not an engineer. The aerodynamics are wild, especially when you get into transonic. Transonic, the air does weird things, like weird things. And then when you get into hypersonics, stuff that looks aerodynamic flies great, or does the stuff that looks like a brick flies really, really well, and stuff that's aerodynamic flies like trash. Seriously. If you tried to take an SR-71 and have it go as fast as the space shuttle, the SR-71 would not fly correctly. I know. It starts to get really weird because you start to get wake effects and stuff, like boundary layers. And when you're going past Mach 5, that boundary layer is on fire. <laughs> you know, just it's on fire. Whatever. Two, because each side, or does it not matter? Well, Blackness, we were kind of assuming with how many sonic booms would you hear that the plane is just flying overhead. Um, if it's flying overhead, you'd just probably hear one big one. Yeah, just one big one. But you could hear different, you could hear it, it would probably be different if you were flying next to the plane. Oh, yeah. Sonic boom, yeah, sound is weird like that, man. You're not on fire, Ricky Bobby. So I guess you could do aircraft identification by sonic boom, technically. Wouldn't be the first time we use sound to figure out where stuff is. Submarines can detect certain planes from, from the water. Because those planes are so loud that the, the water that they're flying over absorbs some of the sound. There's a famous Russian plane called the Tupolev-95. The Tu-95 has really loud engines because of how, because, well, because of the type of engines that the Russians chose uh, for, that, for that type of plane. And the engines were so ridiculously loud, submarines could pick them up from underwater because the water absorbed some of the sound. Supersonic waves are Cherenkov radiation lines. Oh, business, don't make me choose. Those are both really neat. See last. What's up, Sebi? Dude, Mercedes is so salty now that there's neither a Merck F1 car nor a Merck FE car at the FIA ga gala. Ugh. Sebi... Look, you guys got screwed, okay? But you guys, Mercedes have been getting good calls, calls in their favor the entire freaking season, man. Give it a rest. You take your licks and go and move on. Then you can go back to getting 90% of the freaking calls. Like, bro, this is ridiculous. Stop being so, stop being so whiny. I get it. You guys got screwed, all right? Woe is you, right? I'm a Ferrari fan, man. We haven't won dicks since 2007. How do you think I feel? Yeah, Sebi, I got you. I got you. Yeah, I know, drifting. I was just, I was just trying to be here. <laughs> Let's get back to Starship, shall we? Is that Glock? Oh, stop. Stop. Stop, drifting. Don't do that to me. No, Mikey. No, no. No, Mikey. No, that's not right. Yeah, man. I, I, I don't understand how they can sit there and be like, oh, we got screwed when you haven't realized that, you know, the stewards have been giving calls in your favor for, like, the past, like, ten years. It's ridiculous. Like, I get it. You want to win, but do you want to win that bad to the point where you look like a bunch of whiny, you know? Like, I don't want to win like that. I'd rather lose than freaking win on a ref's call. I'm dead serious. I don't like winning like that. That's lame. But I, I mean, I guess, I mean, Red Bull probably doesn't give a frick, you know? <laughs> anyway, let's get back to this.
Was that a launch clamp? Uh, that was the vehicle stabilization system, Wolfie. The VSS. It's designed to hold Super Heavy in place so they can crown a starship on it. Yeah, I know about Cherenkov. Cherenkov is business. That's really cool. I'm not... My nuclear physics is terrible, dude. I'm not that good at that. But I know about Cherenkov. It's really cool. Yeah, it lights up and stuff. That's really neat. That's some future stuff, man. Okay, I'll meet you in the middle. Nuclear-powered rocket. Yeah? I'll meet you in the middle. Nuclear-powered rocket. Done. Final offer. Where did you get the sound clip? Could you whisper it? It's on NASA... Uh... Okay, the Sonic Booms, Fifi? That is from... It's from a documentary uh, called... Uh, what's the name of it? It's a shuttle documentary from the 80s. The Dream is Alive. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Roblox. Yeah, it, it's from the first, like, 30 seconds of The Dream is Alive. But there's plenty of NASA footage where you can lift Sonic Booms from. Just type shuttle landing in, into YouTube and it'll give you what you need. I forgot the name of it, man. We can't watch it anymore because it gets claimed. Damn it. <laughs> what do you think about our Lord and Savior, the XF-84? Uh, I mean, it's a good plane if you want to annoy the neighbors, JM. First film you saw at the Omni Theater. Nice, Jim. Cool. It's the Smithsonian. I don't... I think it's IMAX, Jim. I don't think Dream is Alive is the Smithsonian. I don't think. If you could prove otherwise, man, I'd be really happy because I love that documentary. Showing that documentary on stream is the best. It's a really awesome documentary. Nice, Jim. Tasty, isn't it? That is the cake of my people. Yeah, so this is the hood that has the umbilical. See these two things right here? Those two hoses? Those two hoses that are this freaking big? That's a lot of flex hose right there. That's the fuel lines. Fuel and oxidizer, baby. Right there. What do you think of a pure hydrogen cold gas thruster? Apparently you can get up to 296 specific impulse out of it. Uh, I think the handling of hydrogen username makes hydrogen a pain in the butt dude it's hard to handle so the benefits of the efficiency benefits uh are outweighed by the handling that it's you know you have a pro but you have way bigger of a con it's you just use nitrogen so all right right here see the, see this thing one clamp there and the other one you can't kind of see it because it's in the way it's right there these guys are a VSS, guys. It's called a Vehicle Stabilization System. The VSS basically, uh, and all of this is on the quick disconnect arm, which is this big thing. The VSS holds super heavy in place. So, like, if it's windy, right, the, the thing could be doing this, right? And this is, Starship isn't the only one that has this. SLS has this. Uh, and um, Saturn V also had this. The shuttle didn't because the shuttle is stubby compared to this thing. I mean, Super Heavy is taller than a shuttle stack, e easily. Um, or actually, it might be about the same size, but anything. But any, anyway, these things right here, there's a telescoping arm that'll push forward and it'll bring these Don't arms in, up. and they'll hold Super Heavy in place while they put the Starship on top of that. And then this umbilical right here will move forward from that hydraulic. See, see this line right there? That's a hydraulic that'll move the umbilical back and forth, and it'll attach to Starship. They theoretically should be able to put Starship on, crown Super Heavy with a Starship on top of it, and attach the umbilical kind of automatically, which is still crazy to me. Th this thing should have automated integration, or at least as close as you're going to get to it. Mega Doomer, 42-month resub, and Riv with an 8-month resub. Thank you very much. Did the shuttle have one? No. No, T-Man. The shuttle did not have a vehicle stabilization system. Think about it. Why would you not want that? Well, the shuttle needs to be able to rock back and forth. Remember when the engines, the engines light, the whole stack does this, it moves, right? 
You don't need, you don't want a vehicle stabilization system. The SRBs are your stabilization system. Pretty cool, huh? Nice. And that's cool. Trying to see where it's venting from. I think it's venting from up there. Yep. That's cool, Lundrod. Burb. Burbs. See the burbs up there? Dang burb. Oh, this is this is eye candy, man. All the pipes and all the all the oh, pretty colors. Like just it's eye candy, man. Bird. Why don't they capture the venting fuel and repressurize it? And that's probably not venting fuel, Violin. I think it's nitrogen. In which case, venting nitrogen, yeah, it's fine. They do have a scavenger system built in for, for reclaiming methane. Yeah. I don't think so, Bond. Maybe a cruise ship? But, I mean, even then, I don't think cruise ships have automated guidance. I'm pretty sure they don't. You still need a pilot for that. <sighs> That's a really awesome picture. Just thought I'd let you know. I don't know, Eamon Demon. I'm not sure what SpaceX is up to. They did something very peculiar with SN20. They took its lifting points off. Why do you think NASA abandoned hydrocarbon fuels in the 80s? If you look at basically all expendable vehicle proposals in the 90s, they all used hydrogen. The performance, JM. The, the performance all day. I mean, Delta is... You could go so far as to say that Delta IV is derived from the shuttle. Yeah, it's an SDLV. It's close. RS-68s share, share a common lineage with the RS-25. And then RL-10s... RL-10s don't, but you get the idea. Yeah, they covered them up with plates, which is very strange. Did, did we see that here in the last shot? Nope, not yet. Here, let's back up a little bit. Yeah, okay, that's what we just saw. Do you think they're getting ready to test lift with the chopsticks? Yeah, yeah, maybe. So, we'll see it in the updated video tomorrow. But see these, see these guys right here? They took the hooks off, which is very strange, because SN21, or SN20, and keep in mind, this is a picture of 21. It's a different starship. I'm talking about this guy. They took the hooks off of off of 20, which is a little bit, that's a little peculiar. Any KSP? Uh, I'm going to play MSC tonight. Hey, Technical, what's up, man? 44 month resub. Thomas posted this on Discord. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we can look at that. So, they took the hooks off and they put more tiles on, which is weird. That's my guess, Roblox, but how are they going to... Okay, so here's the thing. That's over here. It's on the suborbital test pad. So, how are you going to get that over there? Unless they're going to get the crane out and put some type of special jig on it. Yeah, maybe. Right? Not too much. Just been super busy for the last few months. I get it, man. It's the holidays, dude. Everybody's busy. Fly it over there? I mean, maybe. It doesn't have any landing legs. Mappy, I don't know. It might not be going orbital. I have no idea. I mean... Guys, it feeds into something else that I've been seeing with SpaceX. And keep in mind, this isn't news. This is just EJ kind of thinking about things. So 
they moved booster number five out in out here where SN15 and SN16 are. These are the SN15 flew. That thing is flown. SN16 never flew. It it never did. So Booster 5, which is brand new, also never flown, is out here. And then Booster 6, which is this thing over here, that that's a little stubby boy. Which is very strange. Usually when SpaceX makes a makes a test article like this, they figured out a better way to do it. So I'm not sure exactly what that means for Starship, to be honest with you. I don't know, but I started to notice that they're doing things that aren't really concurrent with what they said they were going to do. I.e., you know, you'd think that Booster 5, right? You'd think that Booster 5 would be basically ready to go, and once SN20 and Booster Number 4 fly, 5 would be the next one up with SN21, right? That's what you'd think. But... That doesn't seem to be the case here. They seem to have changed some things. So I'm not sure... I'm not sure what starships are going to fly for the orbital test, but it's very clear to me from the Booster 6 testing article that they found something. They found a better way to do something. And I'm not sure what that means for the program. I noticed that last time I... Last time... Re rewind that 10 seconds. The last time I saw something like this was when I noticed that SpaceX started to roll out test articles. And they did that right after SN15 flew. And SN16, unflown, they rolled that out halfway finished out of the out of the their integration bay and put it over here. And they've let it's set it's been there since. It's been there for six months. They haven't touched it. So it's very it's very weird. What happened to Booster One? Booster One was a was a test, uh, a test article. Uh, uh, Booster Two, they did some more testing with Booster Three. They static fired it on the on the pad, and then they scrapped it. Booster Four is sitting on the orbital launch mount right now, and Booster Five is right there. Fifteen and sixteen aren't just sitting there. There's machinery underneath them that's running. That's probably the pressurization systems crafter. They're probably just keeping them pressurized, which is very strange. Why? Yeah, I mean, you guys say hypersonic, supersonic test article, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but these things haven't flown. These things, Starship. These these don't even have the right umbilicals to hook up to Starship anymore. The umbilical for Starship is right here on twenty, on twenty, twenty one, twenty two, which means these can't hook up to the orbital pad. So. These things ain't flying anytime soon. Suborbital pad B it has been retooled for SN21, which has the side umbilical. And suborbital pad A was retooled for a super heavy. So none of these have the right umbilicals on them anymore. Now, that, that doesn't to say that SpaceX couldn't just change it. They changed it. Why not change it back? But why would they change it to an outdated system, you know? Ah, Crasher, Starship can free float. They can, it doesn't need to be pressurized. It probably helps though. No, username, not yet. Yeah, Entropy, there you go. Do you know of any emergency escape system when something goes wrong with a booster? No, Starship is designed like an airplane. No escape system. Airplanes don't have a launch escape system. Violent, before... Okay, I've had this conversation a bajillion times. Before you say, well, well, that's not safe. Well, airplanes don't have a launch escape system and they're safe. So what's the difference? Flying a lot. The reason why airplanes don't have ejector seats, parachutes, etc., etc. I mean, some of them do. I get it. And fighter planes have ejector seats because, you know, in, in case a missile hits your airplane, which is something that Starship probably isn't worried about. Uh, that's the way that SpaceX wants to design it. They want to fly it a lot and get a lot of good data and understand how the vehicle works and basically mature it 
and then they'll put people on it down the road. You can fly unmanned. Uh, so you could fly it as many times as you want before you can prove empirically that it's safe uh, for people. Now, the next part of that is, uh, you know, will people agree with that? No. Do I agree with that? I don't know. The data needs to prove it. I don't give a crap. I don't give a crap what you think. <laughs> the numbers have to prove it. Engineering without analysis is just an opinion, and opinions don't matter in engineering. It's all about the numbers. It ain't what you know. It's what you can prove. So we'll see if Starship has a, a safe enough launch escape system or if it doesn't need it or need it or, or what. We'll see if it's safe enough. Only time will tell. But, Violent, I'll tell you, everybody and their mother's weighing in on this. Oh, I don't think it's safe. Well, good. Engineering doesn't give a frick what you think. Engineering doesn't care what I think. Engineering doesn't even care what Elon thinks. It's only what you can prove. It looks like they're working on 15's aft flaps. Yeah, interesting. I don't know. Who knows? But yeah, e either way, this is a pretty cool picture, though. Huh? Something out of the future here, man. So soon we'll see starships on little transporters at, at like a terminal gate, like an airplane, and then they'll taxi them out to, to a pad to pick it up and put it on there. Wouldn't that be something? It would take more time to get the damn thing to the pad than it would to fly it. <laughs> That's right, came here. I agree, Fur. I don't think... Th I mean, LES's launch escape systems... Okay, here's the here's the thing, guys. And this is something... This is going to sound ridiculous. But it's something you need to learn about risk adversity and systems engineering, okay? Look. SLS has a launch escape system on it. Starship does not have a launch escape system on it, right? Does that mean that I personally think that launch escape systems are good or bad? It depends on the application. Starship with a launch escape system is stupid. That's a dumb idea. That is, Fifi, you're right. The, if you try to do what Elon Musk is doing with SpaceX and expect failure like that, you're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to get anywhere because they're trying to operate a rocket like an airplane, i.e. land it, bring it back over to the pad, fuel it back up again, new cargo, launch it again. If you're trying to do something like that, a launch escape system is tedious and it's basically useless. You're going to have to check that over every time and that's more time that the rocket spends on the ground. And the more time the rocket spends on the ground, the cost goes up, just like an airplane, right? Because they're trying to operate it under the construct of an airplane. So a launch escape system makes no freaking sense. That makes no sense. From, an, from a systems engineering standpoint, that's stupid. That's a waste of time. That's as stupid as putting ejector seats on a 737. The weight of 100 ejector seats is going to make the plane basically only be able to carry like 10 people. You know what I mean? The ejector seats are heavy because they're little rocket engines. I know, I know a couple guys that worked on those things. Um, now, simultaneously, with SLS, you're aiming for a low frequency of flight. SLS is only supposed to fly once, twice, three times, four times, please, a year. With that infrequency of flights, something could and is bound to happen, you know, I mean, God forbid, right? Something is bound to happen that could go wrong. So a launch escape system makes a lot more sense for the infrequency of flight. In that systems engineering construct with how SLS is engineered, that makes way more sense. That's smart. Long story short, I wouldn't operate Starship with a launch escape system, and I wouldn't operate SLS without a launch escape system. Both of those are stupid. Thrust you can trust. Beep, ejecto cedo, cuz! Yeah. You see, it's, it's not... It's not Nothing like, nothing in aerospace engineering is black and white like this. Oh, all launch escape systems are bad, or no launch escape systems are bad. That's You're not thinking about this correctly. And I'm not saying that anybody here is, but th that, that, that's not how you think about that. It's, it's all about the construct of the system. Engineering is about application, and application alone. If you're trying to do something like Starship, a launch escape system doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. But simultaneously, if you're trying to do something like SLS, it makes all the sense in the world. It's not... I see people throw it around like they know what they're talking about, saying like, oh, all rockets should have launch escape systems, or oh, all rockets shouldn't have launch escape systems because we should fly more. The, the reality is, is that it's not that simple. 
it's rocket science. Remember that. It's not that simple. This is called systems engineering, okay? Which is a subset of rocket science, I guess, when it comes to building a launch vehicle. It's very important to understand this. Depends on what you're doing. Gemini didn't fly with a launch escape system. Why? Who can tell me why? Mercury did. Gemini did. Gemini didn't. And Apollo did. The shuttle didn't. NASA at times has said... NASA at times has, has chosen to not opt in to a launch escape system, like with the shuttle. Because they were trying to achieve high-frequency, low-cost, reusable flight. Now, with Apollo, it's the opposite of that. So a launch escape system makes more sense. See what I'm talking about? It's about the application. It's not one or the other. That's very important to understand. And I see people throw it around, you know, like throw around, you know, oh, everything should have a launch escape system. No, no, that just should demonstrates that you fundamentally don't understand what you're talking about. Engineering is difficult, man, but it, it's all about application. Not why did you do it? What are you trying to do? <laughs> Straight up. If you, ask an ear, if you ask an engineer a question like that and they go, huh, what are you trying to do? That, that, that's, the, that's the answer you get. If you ask a question like that, they'll get confused. Believe me, I've tried this. I've tried this stimuli before. If there's no launch escape system on Starship plus boosters, there is, emer is there an emergency separation system on Starship? Sure. It really depends on the design. Bingo. Exactly, Kim. It depends on what you're doing. That's why a 737 doesn't have ejection seats. That's why a fighter jet does have an ejection seat. Because if a missile flies up your, up your tailpipe, you're going to need to get away from the plane pretty quick before you die. <laughs> right? Like, you get a missile up your tail, up, oh, bye bye pull the ripcord, see ya. It's not a ripcord, but you get the idea. The space shuttle had ejector seats for the first four flights, see Kraken? Mm -hmm. For the test regime. But even then, the ejector seats were useful for maybe about 30 seconds. After 30 seconds, it's dead weight. Yeah, XBZ, it's all about application. That is the big important thing to understand. Application, application, application. What, not why did you do that? What are you trying to do? I see people that like, I see spaceflight fans in the chat all the time that make that mistake. Now, oh, why did SpaceX do that? This is a much better way. This is a much better way to do it. Do you know that for sure? Do you know that for sure? No. The answer is no. A thousand percent of the time, because a, the people saying that stuff usually don't work for SpaceX, and b, usually don't understand systems engineering either. But that's why I sit here and do it. I'm not saying like, oh, those people are idiots. They're they're passionate about what they do. But once again, that's very very important to understand that stuff. Anyway. Systems engineering. If you would like to know more, go Google this. The Systems Engineering Handbook. It's real nerd stuff, but it really, really makes a whole lot of sense. It's on NASA's website, or it's out floating around on the internet. But, yeah. Cool. Alright, guys. Oh, and a little bit of uh, history here. Oh, there is other news. James Webb got delayed till uh, the 24th. <sighs> because, of course, it got delayed till the 24th. Hey, weather guy, what's going on? Old cars had an ejection seat. Lack of seats, but lack of seat belts. See, Spraz, the best part is no part. Can't get into a car accident if the car crashes and you get thrown out the window. You're not part of the car accident anymore. It's smart. Smart. Yeah, Kumo, you're not you're not wrong, dude. <laughs> I know, Bob. Why, why Christmas Eve? Why would you do that? Aren't the holidays stressful enough, NASA? Come on, man. <laughs> Jam, I'm trying to work through some heat transfer calculations for regenerative cooling engines. I tried looking at RPE, but my brain is being bricked. That means you're punching above your weight level, Jam. Back it up and find something that you understand. That's what I do. <laughs> if I decide to dive into a subject about rocket propulsion or something and I'm reading Japanese, I'm like, okay. 
I try to find something that I understand, go read about that so I can better understand what the heck I'm trying to trying to do. It's kind of backwards for how you should be taught, but then again, I never learned how to learn correctly. That's what I like to tell people. <laughs> Question, how do we feel about ejection seats on helicopters? Application base... Re <laughs> I hope the blades eject too, <laughs> or, else, or else you're going to make chop suey out of the pilot. But then again, if I'm remembering right, some helicopters have ejector seats that shoot down. <laughs> it really depends on what you're trying to do, Waffle, huh? <laughs> God, I hope the blades I hope the blades separate. That would really suck. It's all Greek to you. I mean, yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the K the KF fifty destroys the blades so the ejector seats work. Well, I mean, it's not like you're gonna need them. If you're ejecting from the helicopter, I don't think I don't think if you're ejecting from a K-850 that you're going to need the blades for much longer. I mean, just remember, what are you trying to do? Not why did you do that, right? <laughs> See? <laughs> I mean, that's kind of a stupid way of looking at it, but hey, whatever. <laughs> I don't think we need the blades for that much longer if we're pulling the ripcord on the helicopter, you know? <laughs> yeah, you just need a synchronizer, Violet, right? <laughs> did the Lunar Descent module have ejector seats? No, they didn't have enough. They didn't have Sea Kraken. They didn't have enough on the lunar, uh, on the lunar lander for a toilet, let alone an ejector seat. Ziploc bags. Yeah, gross. How many flights did the shuttle fly with ejector seats? First four flights. First four shuttle flights, STS-123 and 4, were part of the OFT program or Orbiter Flight Test Program, testing out different systems on the shuttle. Uh, SDS-1 was basically going up and going down, making sure that all that stuff works. And then 2, 3, and 4 tested the arm and tested uh, uh, a bunch, did a bunch of experiments on how the shuttle moves through different parts of the atmosphere, long story short. SDS-5 was the first shuttle mission on the books, and they deployed go at throttle up. two satellites, I think? If you ejected on the moon, where would you go from there? I don't know. And yeah, I don't have an answer to that. Go up? down? <laughs> hey, where does this ejector seat go? It goes up. Cammy, 51 month resub. <laughs> go around? My dad had a car in the 60s where the engine was in the back. He actually got seat belts installed because it was a cool new thing in his eyes and it actually saved him. Yeah, that sounds like a Corvair, Pythos. Corvairs are cool cars, but yes, they... It turns out having a lot of weight over the rear of the car can, you know, make handling not work as well if you, uh, you know, if you're not prepared for having a lot of weight over the rear wheels like that. Yeah, that's called snap over steer. Yeah, that happens. B-52s have ejector seats that go down. Oh, that Pythos, I'm kind of torn between that being one hell of a ride and please God, no, I don't ever want that to happen. Then you're stuck without a limb. I'd rather go down with the ship. Yeah, Ian, I'm kind of with you on that one. Yeah, that's a Corvair. Your old man had a Corvair, Pythos. Those are cool. Those are cool cars. Turbo from the factory on some. Notice me, senpai. What? What do you want? What's up? Corvairs are cool, man. Super underrated. MSC time? It's MSC time when I when I want to play MSC. You just don't need to eject on takeoff or landing or below a thousand feet. Yeah, I don't yeah, that doesn't sound fun, Pythos. That doesn't sound like a good time. Can I have permissions to build a small rocket factory in the industrial sector and compete with pineapple on the Minecraft server? Oh no. Alright. Flag and I wanna play MSC now. But let's I need I need to check. You you want a rocket factory? Oh! Ian started to build his rocket factory. Alright, Sanchai, fine. Where do you wanna build? <laughs> Pythos, it just doesn't it, it sounds like fun at first, but then then you realize what's going on and it's probably not good for your body. Where I stand? Nah, that's too hilly, dude. You need to... You need to build one next door. <laughs> 
No launch pads, though. Only factories, okay? <laughs> Build it right there. No, that's too close to the that's too close to the fields. Um <laughs> Oh my god. Can you get away with building it right here? Smile, can I check your last? Sure, man. What's up? Is it humanly possible to throw something off of the ISS and have it deorbit? Uh it really depends on the shape. You're susceptible to aerodynamics at that altitude. Yeah, Sanchai, build it, build it right here. That lot's been empty for years. <laughs> build it, build it right here. You, you, you can build it there. Build the <laughs> Oh my god. Yeah, do it, do it, Ian. I like this. This is good, man. Any work get done over here? Yeah, okay. They, they got the ho they got the foundation hollowed out for the subway. Man, look at the progress here. You guys, you guys, a freaking beast mode at this, dude. I dig it, man. I dig it. Cool. All right. Anyway, guys, that's going to do it. And check this out. Last bit here. Today in 1965, Wally Shira and Tom Stafford launched on Gemini 6 to rendezvous with Gemini 7, which had launched on December 4th. First space rendezvous. Today in 1965... I agree, Bram, yeah. Yeah, JM, if you if you have a low enough ballistic coefficient, yeah, you won't experience re-entry heating. But the problem is it has to be super light. Uh, JM, how I like to describe that to people is if you had a rock and a piece of paper and you drop them off the top of the building, which one is going to hit the ground first? If you make your spacecraft light enough, it doesn't have a lot of momentum when it's re-entering and you, you, you won't experience as much re-entry heating. Now that doesn't really happen with big metal rockets, but it's possible. They didn't dock, no, no, no. I wanna say that they switched seats, but I don't think that's right either. I think they just hung out near each other. Yeah, they just demonstrated station keeping, which is a big, that's a big deal. They would not dock. The crews also discussed the possibility of Stafford performing an EVA from 6A to 7, swapping places with Jim Level, but the commander... Gemini 7, Frank Borman objected, pointing out that that would require a level to wear an uncomfortable EVA suit on a long-duration mission. Yep, okay. They just rendezvoused near each other. All right, guys. Time for Summer Car. I hope you enjoyed Space News and Rocket Talk, I guess. Now we're going off to beautiful sunny Finland.